Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name's Ian Bruce. I'm the Science and Policy Manager at the David Suzuki Foundation, and I'll be your MC this evening, along with uh, Max Cameron from UBC. This evening's event, Against the Odds, How Democracies Can Solve Climate Change, is hosted by the David Suzuki Foundation and the University of British Columbia's Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, and we're very honored to be partnering them, uh, with them tonight. We would also like to thank our sponsors, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, uh, Bullfrog Power, the Sitka Foundation, the GenCon Foundation, for their generous support. Thank you very much. So certainly climate change and democracy, those are two very big topics. So why are we hosting this event today? Well, certainly climate change isn't so much a technical problem in, in this, in for the example that we have things like renewable energy, that those solutions exist. Climate change is more of a social challenge. Uh, the latest science suggests that we need to move to a, a zero emission energy system over the next 30 to 50 years if we're to address climate change. Um, and to do so, we need to put in place policies that will certainly challenge the status quo. Phasing out fossil fuels, prioritizing things like clean energy, building more transit and pedestrian friendly communities are, are very tall challenges for our political systems and our political leaders. It's interesting because since the United Nations climate change uh, summit happened in Copenhagen in 2009, climate change policy has largely been described as a political failure at the international and at the federal level. Yet, if you peel back the layers, there has been tremendous successes at the local and regional levels that are advancing solutions and el eliminating carbon emissions at an incredible pace. Uh, and we have a very exciting program for you tonight we're gonna learn from two success stories on how, they, uh, on how these successes came about, the political challenges these jurisdictions faced, and how they beat the odds. We're gonna hear about uh, one example from Ontario and the other from California, and what drove those policy solutions, how political decisions and alignment of economic forces, air pollution, and the threat of climate change set in motion a retooling of economies and solutions that have rippled across North America. To set this up in our first half of our program, we're gonna hear from Max Cameron, the director of UBC's Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, who will take us through some of the questions we will be exploring tonight about democracy and the politics behind decision-making. We'll, this will be followed by a presentation from Lois Corbett on the story of how Ontario phased out coal-fired power and favored clean energy. That action alone has been the single largest elimination of carbon emissions in all of North America. Then, following Lois's presentation, will be followed by a keynote presentation by Wade Crowfoot, who is the Deputy Cabinet Secretary for the State of California, who will, be, who will speak to us about California's implemented, how California implemented the state's landmark Global Warming Solutions Act and overcame political opposition. The keynote presentation will be followed by a panel discussion with the Thais editor, uh, David Beers. And then we're gonna have a short refreshment break and uh, we'll let you know exactly how long that is because I, 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 assume, I am expecting a very lively panel discussion. Um, and then for the second half, we're gonna focus on a local example of regional decision-making on an investment in transit and transportation plan that would reduce Metro Vancouver's carbon footprint. And for this discussion, we're gonna hear from Port Coquitlam Mayor Greg Moore about the upcoming Metro Vancouver transportation referendum, the opportunity and what's at stake. And that will also be followed by a panel discussion and we've got some amazing panelists here tonight. I would like to encourage everyone to stay for the reception following the evening. We're gonna have food and refreshments available and continue on the lively discussion. At this time, I'd like to, every, to remind everyone with a mobile device to please uh, turn that off, or, or to turn the ringers off, uh, certainly. Um, of course, we do encourage people to share their thoughts on social media, and we'll be using the hashtag climate democracy tonight. So for those of you on Twitter, uh, or social uh, media, please uh, use that hashtag. As well, you can find us uh, at the Twitter handle at David Suzuki Foundation, which is FDN, or 
at UBC Democracy. To start our program, I would like to recognize that we are on the unceded traditional ter ter territory of the Coast Salish peoples and invite Elder Shane Point from the Musqueam Nation to offer us an opening welcome. Thank you, Shane. Hi, Dave. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Beautiful people. Strong, strong people. It's good to see you. Good to see you. One of the great words that we have in our Coast, langu Coast Salish language, Hulkaminum, is is Natsamat. Natsamat means we're one. Natsamat, one. The other great word is Shkwalawan. Shkwalawan means heart and the mind. Natsamat Shkwalawan, we're all one heart and we're one mind. That's the, that's the law that we move from. It's not a philosophy, it's not an idea, it's a law, not samat. Not samat shkwalawan, that's law. In my family, my home, my community, that's law, we're one. What we're learning to do now is we're learning to share that, that treasure of not samat shkwalawan with everyone. We've kept it to ourselves for a long time, but now we're starting to share it with everybody so that everybody understands that truly, regardless of where we come from in the world, we're human beings. My mother, when I was a boy, she said, Shane, you're not a man. You're not Coast Salish. You're not New Chonath. You are a human being, therefore related to all human beings around the world. So when I look out at you, I know that my mother's words are true. I look out at aunties, uncles, brothers, sisters, nieces, and nephews. So what I'd like you to do, and I'm learning this as I go along, we constantly say words, but we don't demonstrate. We don't take action. So I'm learning to have everybody take action. Thank you very much, Shane, for that moving welcome and the invitation to resolve to turn words into action. Uh, I'm Max Cameron, and on behalf of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, we are very proud to be partnering with the David Suzuki Foundation to organize this event. We're proud because we know, and public opinion polls tell us that the public knows, that climate change is real, and that it poses an existential threat to humanity's future. But this knowledge is useless unless we can create the political will to act. Now, political science tells us that politicians' first concern is with getting elected, and that means they have short time horizons. Uh, they have to compete for votes, and that makes it hard for them to ask voters to make sacrifices. <coughs> they need money to campaign and a growing economy to sustain their popularity when in government. And that makes them sensitive to the interests of corporations, including the fossil fuel industry. So it might seem that markets and democracy work against far-sighted climate action policies that would benefit future generations. And for those who want climate action, one hears much despair about our political process. For those who oppose these policies, one hears denial and fear. Denial that we're entering the Anthropocene and fear that climate policies 
will be like a Trojan horse that will lead to greater government intervention. Can we get beyond this despair, denial, and fear? Can we find a middle ground? I believe that we can. We can address climate change while growing the economy and in the process deepening our democracy. David Suzuki argues that it's a mistake to separate the economy and the environment. And he's right, this is a false dichotomy. And accepting this false dichotomy leads us to frame our collective choices in terms of either the economy or the environment. But the real choice is different. We can choose to unsustainably maximize short-term economic growth, which will bring us to the brink of disaster very quickly. Or we can choose a more sustainable, innovative path to development that extends the horizon of shared prosperity. And the sooner we make the transition to a fossil-free world, the farther that horizon stretches. Facilitating this transition is the single most important things, thing that governments will do in the 21st century. Happily, we have examples of governments that are already getting started, not only in Denmark and Sweden and Germany, but also closer to home, California, in Ontario, and here in BC. Today, we're gonna to give you examples of democratic jurisdictions where climate solutions are being pursued. And our speakers will show that this can be done while growing the economy. As you listen to the outstanding speakers and panelists that we have assembled for today's event, you can anticipate hearing a number of themes. One of the issues that you will hear about is leadership. Sometimes leadership comes from unexpected places. In fact, the environmental file has already seen more than its share of Nixon goes to China moments. Think of Schwarzenegger's leadership in California, Gordon Campbell's carbon tax in BC, Preston Manning working with Mike Harcourt in the Ecofiscal Commission, or Michael Bloomberg calling on Obama to use Keystone to get climate action in Canada. I believe that progressives need to work with conservatives because climate change is too important to leave to partisan wrangling. In an article, uh, an op-ed that I wrote in the TAI today, um, I call for a progressive conservative green politics that's intended to be a sort of cheeky uh, uh, title. By bringing conservatives on board, we may need to emphasize market mechanisms like pricing emissions. And it may be necessary to make arguments in terms of moral authority, the need to preserve the sanctity and the purity of our natural world and the responsibility not to dump our problems on future generations. It's sound economics and sound politics to wean government off of the fossil fuel industry and the fossil fuel industry off of government subsidies. Our governments need to get behind mature, innovative, and job-creating green businesses in the real economy that are not driven exclusively by the need to maximize short-term shareholder value. It's also sound politics to use participatory innovations to mobilize the resources in society that we need to get things done. Part of the problem, much like subordinating uh, the environment to the economy, uh, uh, subordinating politics to the economy, uh, it, it hinders our capacity to use those resources to get things done. As our speakers will show, it's possible to make the shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy, to promote sustainability and green innovation and build public support in the face of corporate pressures. We will begin our program today by looking at how Ontario has phased out coal and adopted a Green Energy and Green Economy Act modeled on what Germany and other European countries are doing. Lois Corbett is the Executive Director of the Conservation Council of New Brunswick. She'll tell the story of how Ontario is leading the way in this country and the political lessons we can learn from it. She'll also talk about the moratorium on fracking in New Brunswick. Lois is a longtime environmental activist who worked as senior policy advisor to three ministers of the environment in Ontario before, since 2003, before establishing her own consulting practice. While working for the minister, she helped to organize the premier's clean air summits and provided advice on the regulation overseeing the phase out of coal-fired electricity and Ontario's climate, action, climate change action plan. An environmental policy expert, Lois has experience with and national and international connections to a large number of progressive policy files covering a wide range of environmental issues. 
Please join me in welcoming Lois Corbett. Hello. Um, I was going to share with you my um, first slide that shows the 10 foot snowbanks in front of the house in, in uh, Fredericton, but I decided to just get right into it. Um, my brother starts the lament of his life by saying, I have three sisters. This is the Lakeview um, coal-fired electricity station, um, the former Lakeview station, in Mississauga, just outside of Toronto. And it was called the Three Sisters by the sailors of Lake Ontario who used the lights to guide them, them, their, them into harbour in Mississauga. And I thought it was an appropriate place to start the story about the phase out of coal with actually watching a coal plant come down. Whoops, I need to go back one, sorry. I'm going to tell you a story, and that's what I'm good at. I got the gift of gab. <laughs> Irish Catholic families, what to expect. I want to start you with some context. This is my uh, young cousin, Will. He wants to play hockey for the Canadians when he grows up, or be an astronaut. I just think, I just like that red hair and freckle guy. This is what, this is what it's all about, isn't it? Working for their tomorrow. It's uh, the coal story is that lots of heroes, one big villain, a couple other villains, but mostly one big villain. Lots of love, lots of loss along the way, and years and years and years of suspense. So it might be a movie someday. Uh, Jack Gibbons, who's the, the, one of the key heroes in the story from the Clear, Clean Air Alliance in Ontario, is writing a book about it right now. I'll leave it to Jack to make sure that he gets all the facts right and the years right, and I'll just tell you the romance of the story. The people of Ontario are the heroes and the heroines in this, the fact that they embraced over years um, the democratic call to action to ask their political leaderships of all parties to phase out coal. I think they're not just the folks who can now enjoy cleaner air to breathe, but also deserve a lot of credit. The villain in the story is coal, and we did deliberately vilify coal as the fuel. The doctor himself is a hero, our doctor here in this room. He certainly came out and helped us, in, in fact, in one election tour in 19. 99, that's how far back we go. The doctors of Ontario, the Ontario Medical Association, played a key role in the phase out of coal campaign when they released a study showing the unintended or the economic and health costs of air pollution in Ontario. I can tell you, I think, without a doubt, that if the doctors and nurses of Ontario hadn't stood shoulder to shoulder with the environmental community and the political community, I'm not sure we would have been successful. We had a series of premiers during all the years it took us in Ontario to phase out coal, starting with Mike Harris, then Irvi Ernie Eves, then Dalton McGinty, and now Kathleen Wynne. There's, I'll tell you a little bit about a couple cabinet meetings. I won't go in, into any sort of secrecy there because you know I had to sign a document. And I'll tell you about those will he or won't he moments along the line. You have to remember back in 1990, wow, geez, 1990, I guess, when we were starting this. We really were just coming off the success of reducing emissions that cost, caused as it rain. We had just signed an agreement to reduce sulfur and nitrogen oxide emissions primarily from coal plants. Um, and I think you may, some of you in the room may remember Brian Mulroney and Ronald Reagan singing, singing, well, Irish eyes are, geez, how did I forget that one? <laughs> Irish eyes are smiling when they signed that. Um, but we knew more then at the beginning of this story um, about smog and then eventually carbon dioxide. And we realized, I think, and this is an important aha moment for some folks in the environmental community, that if we were to continue to deal just with emissions, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and even carbon dioxide, that we weren't really getting to the villain in the problem, in the villain in the equation. So the villain in our equation was coal and we had to figure out how to vilify it. It was kind of a leap forward from an analytical perspective. 
At that day and age, of course, Ontario, and particularly the people from Windsor to Toronto to Kingston to Montreal were suffering 10 and 15 days of very, very poor air quality. So smog, acid rain, smog, were the issues of the day. The issue of the day was not climate change and the challenge to our, our atmosphere or carbon pollution, it really was air pollution. We, the government under uh, Bob Ray had embarked on starting uh, an anti-smog management plan and believe it or not, the PC government under Mike Harris kept up that work. So one afternoon, the usual cast of characters downtown Toronto were sitting around the room trying to figure out the strategy going into the that conservatives changed the name from smog management plan to anti-smog action plan. And that's what the big contribution from the Mike Harris government was to smog. <laughs> um, we're sitting around the room um, debating about whether or not we should um, ask Ontario Power to put scrubbers on the largest coal plant in North America in order to deal with um, the air quality issues. And um, there's this great uh, new math in Ontario, it's called OPG math. So they figure out how much it will cost to reduce pollution, then they multiply it by 2.5, and then they double it and tell cabinet that's how expensive it, it will be. Um, so every time the CEO of Ontario Power talked about cleaning up um, air pollution, it got to be more and more expensive. And we really did, it was Pollution Probe, Sierra Club, Toronto Environmental Alliance, and a few other cats around the room, the Lung Associations, saying, well, that is a lot of money. It is sort of hard times. It is a deregulating and a cutting government. Why don't we just get rid of coal? Let's not fuss too much about putting scrubbers on a plant that we think should be phased out. And that really did push us on a new path and a new direction. It was quite an insight. We had a great twist in Ontario, as opposed to other provinces that I've worked in where I've uh, argued against, against coal pretty consistently. Um, Ontario imported all its coal. So it didn't have coal miners. So it was able, you, you weren't up confronting uh, uh, the miner worker um, issue. The most important thing, though, from a context perspective, it was important to get the phase out coal question to the people and then ultimately to the voters. The original cast of characters, I mentioned them. Um, this is Jack Gibbons um, from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. He was there from the beginning. Um, he started work at the pollution probe on this file and, and is still working at the Ontario Clean Air Coalition. And this is at the big party he had last year the King Cole farewell party, and that's the current premier, of course. Um, at the more context, at the time, the Conservative government was um, dismantling um, Ontario Hydro. They were deregulating the utility. It was going to be dismantled into different parts where the public hung on to the winning coal and nuclear combination, and some parts of it were sold, and then the people of Ontario. So the big question going into the, uh, in by 1999, the activists and the doctors lobby on the opposition parties was successful in the sense that both the NDP opposition and the liberal opposition to the conservative government had agreed and included in their platforms a commitment to phase out coal by a certain time, 2007, 2010, something like that. And so the question going into the 1999 election was whether or not we were going to be able to get the progressive conservatives on board with that. And um, Walkerton hit, Harris leaves, people die, sorry, should have said that first, Walkerton hit, people died, Harris leaves, we have a blackout, Ernie Eves, the new premier, he agrees to phase out coal. Kind of happened just like that. Um, I, ha I had a bet with uh, one of the workers at the coal, uh, on the coal fire, the vice president of, of um, fossil fuel generation, how would you like to have that on your business card? For a hundred bucks that I'd never be able to get the conservative government to agree to phase out of coal, well they did in time for the 1999 election. The reason they did that is the people wanted it. The people wanted it. Oops, what am I doing wrong here? We had, uh, as I told you, we had a lot of interesting characters along the way. This is one of my favorite photos in the world of uh, Dr. Suzuki and uh, Dalton McGinty. 
that cell, I think, over there on the right. I think one of the, the things that uh, became important when we were trying to frame up the issues for the people was to include some champions and some leaders around it um, that could help uh, help them both understand the issue and show some leadership going forward. And I can tell you that the work um, that the, both the Suzuki Foundation did and Dr. Suzuki personally um, did himself uh, contributed a lot to helping keep Ontario Premier's feet to the fire with respect to burning out coal. I know that's kind of a mixed metaphor, but it works in for this one. And then there was a question about will he, this one, will he or won't he? Again, um, Dalton's got an interesting background. I don't know if you know that he has a, his undergraduate degree is in biology and then his graduate degree is in law. So nothing quite, I think, like having a Premier with a bit of science under his uh, hat. Uh, but through his tenure, I know towards the end he got into a couple sticky wickets. I wasn't there then. <laughs> towards the end he got into a couple of sticky wickets. But I have to tell you, we worked, while I worked there with him, we um, introduced 18 pieces of very progressive um, environmental protection legislation, inclu including the phase out of coal. And uh, this is when um, um, Arnold was in town and they were signing the joint agreement on um, climate in 2007. Then he said yes. Just a quick, quick story there. Um, the energy ministers of Ontario, um, under Dalton McGuinty, the first energy minister, brought in the cabinet d deck, you know, like a PowerPoint presentation with the minutes that they approve and pass three times. Here's how we can clean up coal. Here's how we can clean up coal. And here's how we can clean up coal. And so finally, at some point in this six, seven month dialogue, uh, Premier McGuinty reminded the energy minister that the government had not campaigned, in fact, on cleaning up coal, but had, in fact, campaigned on getting rid of coal. And maybe the next deck could reflect the commitment to the people of Ontario. That. Chapter two, I'll go quickly through this. It's all fine and dandy to phase out coal, uh, and a government can do it, especially if they own the coal-fired plants, and I think that's uh, great when they do, because it's easier for them to do it. But um, in the second mandate, the same government brought in its Green Energy and Green Economy Act. It had a different cast of characters, the same premier, different energy minister. The energy minister in this case, a new energy minister, George Smitherman, is a key character, a character for sure, and a key character in driving uh, the green energy and green economy um, agenda forward. And the way that happened, and it happened quite uh, sort of slowly at first and then built up and built up, but they got it done quite quickly with respect to a, it being a big piece of legislation. Um, Minister Smitherman was invited to give a keynote talk at a World Energy, Renewable Energy Conference that was that year being held in Kingston, Ontario. He had only been minister for three or four days. Um, uh, Jose Ecaveri from the David Suzuki Foundation called me and said he was going to brief the big guy about asking a question for the minister. We, uh, he ran through the question. I called Minister Smitherman in his car and said, um, the, D Dr. Suzuki is going to ask you this question, so gave him the answer to the question, and he asked the question, George gave the answer. The question was, would you consider bringing in a Green Energy Act for Ontario, and B, would you come with the David Suzuki Foundation on a tour of renewable facilities in Denmark? I'm sure it was much more eloquent than that, but that was what the question was. George said yes, and yes. And that's, what it, that's how we got started on the road towards the Green Energy Act. There's lots more numbers associated with the Green Energy Act, but this is one of my favorites. That the fact that, and I think George, if he were here, were, would be able to tell these stories better. The, the, the key thing about the Green Energy and Green Economy Act was that it enlarged the base of folks who were in favor of it in the sense that it started to involve a new business community, a new young business community, the renewable and solar industries. I remember attending um, solar trade shows 
in the late 90s and early 80, uh, er, uh, early 2000s, and there'd be five, six people there, me and some, you know, some of my friends. Um, and the last one I went to last spring in Ontario had 2,000, and well over three quarters of them were between 25 and 35, young men and women um, working in the solar and wind energy. And I think that that the, the, the interesting part about the Green Energy and Green Economy Act is not so much the system that it built up to encourage these uh, both manufacturers and um, entrepreneurs to come to Ontario, but also that it's a brand new generation. I'm gonna go really fast here. These are the type of results we saw um, in Ontario after the coal plants were down. So about 33 million tons reduced, small and large manufacturing plants, uh, fast tracking really of renewables in Canada and thousands of jobs created. I just wanted to let you know what success looks like. This is my mother and my grandmother and that's wallpaper behind them. So this other stuff behind them, that's called wallpaper. That's called wallpaper too in politics. So you know you're successful when government prints up those big sheets of wallpaper <laughs> for announcements. Sorry guys. This is about a recent announcement in New Brunswick. Um, the New Brunswick just had um, an election. It's a very short chapter. I'll go really fast because I'm out of time. Just wanted to let you know. Um, where the Conservatives had buttons that said, just say yes, printed up. But the question was, just say yes to fracking shale gas. So it was the Premier himself who put the question to the people. The people said no, elected a new government. It was very, very divided province and a very di divided public right now on um, um, pro-fracking of natural gas or against fracking natural gas. It was very much a, a fight over a fuel with very little context. Here's the new guy committed in... Um, during the, his campaign to bring in a moratorium. And he made the, that decision based on environmental protection and on protection to water. There's Sherry Mal, uh, uh, Stephanie Merrill works for me, one of the key campaigners in the, in the anti-fracking campaigns over the last four years. And it was announced on December the 19th, 2014. It's a great Christmas present for all of New Brunswick. <laughs> There's a lot more to come in Chapter 3. It's a moratorium, not a ban. It's a young, young government and a young premier. I take heart in the fact that New York, too, has banned fracking. And I'm hoping to introduce the governor of New York to the premier of New Brunswick and, and watch that great liberal Democrat team and magic happen again. Thank you very much, guys. Great, thank you, Lois. Um, I mean, I think your example uh, clearly shows the power of a province to advance solutions to climate change. Um, it's also clear from your presentation that it's not just for the sake of the environment. Um, certainly there was an, a lot of other things at stake, uh, including building healthier communities and building cleaner, more innovative economies. Um, I think what's interesting is certainly over the past few years, uh, as the 12 years I've worked on climate change, I've noticed the issue evolve dramatically. Um, you know, now we have the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, the International Energy Agency, not one, an environmental organization, all have stated that climate change is the most pressing issue of our generation. Um, even this past year, the US Department of Defense uh, stated that unchecked climate change threatens global stability because of hotter temperatures impacting water scarcity and uh, increasing food production, or decreasing food production and increasing food costs. Um, but what's interesting is that these leading or organizations all agree that climate change is an economic issue, it's a food security issue, it's a human security issue, and that policies that prioritize things like clean energy are central to the solution. And so we're going to hear more right now about how the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world, and that depends on the day, the state of California, uh, has enacted groundbreaking policies that have led to cleaner North American economy, 
that have really driven innovation and have resulted in things like uh, zero emission vehicles and, and hybrid cars that we see on our streets and around the world today. Um, and so it is with great pleasure uh, that I introduce Wade Crowfoot, who is the Deputy Cabinet Secretary and Senior Advisor to California Governor Jerry Brown. Wade's portfolio at the Brown administration includes energy, climate change, transportation, infrastructure, emergency management, military, and veterans issues. He's a busy man. <laughs> uh, across these policy areas, he works to strengthen California's environmental and economic sustainability. He currently co-chairs the governor's drought task force, which uh, the state of California has gone through its worst drought in decades this past year. And prior to joining Governor Brown's administration, Wade served as a regional director for the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, so similar, similar um, to Lois, he, he spent some time as well in the uh, NGO sector. In that role, he helps to defend California's landmark climate change law against political attack and build coalitions in support of stronger environmental policies. Waite also served as a senior environmental advisor to San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom, where he implemented landmark sustainability programs. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome Wade Crowfoot. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to be here today to share California's story, and thanks to the Suzuki Foundation uh, for having us uh, and me up to tell California's story. I'll first say that BC's environmental leadership, and specifically its leadership on climate, is known uh, far beyond Canada's borders. And many of you in the room know that your province actually has the highest price on carbon pollution in the world. And we're envious to say in California, three times the price of the uh, price on carbon uh, we've put on through governmental policy. So my task in the next half hour is to share California's story. Uh, California is obviously a complex state. We like to think of ourselves as the seventh largest economy, uh, just, just surpassed Brazil, uh, a state that we're proud to say hosts some of um, what we think is the, the economy of the future, the Facebook, the Googles, the Twitters of the world, that also hosts some of the poorest Americans living in grinding poverty. We have our country's, uh, some of our country's most beautiful areas and some of our country's uh, worst air pollution. We're thankful for our leaders, uh, a real legacy of environmental leadership through this all. You saw a photo of the governor, as we know him in, uh, in California, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, a Republican who served for eight years, uh, followed by my boss, uh, Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown came back to government. He served in the late 70s, early 80s as California's governor youngest governor uh, in California's history at 34 years old. Imagine being a governor of any state at 34 years old. He came back over three decades later and was just elected to his fourth and final term and is uh, aggressive like I think no other in the United States on, on topics of climate change. So I'm gonna do, answer two, uh, actually three questions for you uh, briefly. What's happening in California? Why are we excited? What's, what's truly actually happening on climate and energy in California? Um, why or how has this happened, which I'll say is, is a real success of a democratic movement, small d, democratic movement. And then third, why is it relevant to you all here today, to British Columbia, and I would argue the world? Well, it starts with a chart that looks pretty common if you come to these climate talks, and that is, can be depressing or boring, uh, or both or neither. It shows you essentially the, uh, our target for carbon emission reductions and where we need to go uh, by the year 2050. California's modern progress on climate change started with the passage of Assembly Bill 32, or AB 32 as it's commonly known in California. And in 2007, Governor Schwarzenegger signed a state law, not a target, not a voluntary aspirational goal, a state law that said California will lower its carbon emissions by 2020, back down to 1990 levels. Uh, first American state to do that. This chart essentially shows you the path that we need to be on to 2020, which is not a terribly uh, ambitious goal if you think where we need to go. But when you see the blue uh, line is the business as usual, and you think about us trying to drive the economy of, uh, of, of a very large state, uh, pretty ambitious. And good news is, is we uh, inventory our, climate em our carbon emissions each year, and we're on track to meet our 2020 target. Importantly, we have a 2050 target as well. Uh, which is an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So AB 32 
made it state law, which is great, but it also gave unprecedented uh, deferred or gave unprecedented authority to state agencies to actually put programs in place to, to actually achieve emission reductions. Uh, the first was uh, a so-called cap and trade uh, system or a price, a one way to price carbon. Now cap and trade can get very confusing, particularly when people that don't like a price on carbon confuse the matter. But understand that a cap on, on uh, carbon emissions or carbon pollution is uh, a legal requirement that uh, measures carbon emissions across our economy and sets a cap that declines over time. And uh, within that cap, uh, for polluters, uh, those polluters have to pay for the pollution that they create. That goes into a fund that by our law has to be plowed back into reducing emissions further. The trade piece comes in where uh, industries that are being regulated by the cap, um, for those that can reduce pollution um, quicker than anticipated, they can sell those credits to laggards and make money. The idea is incentivizing those regulated to reduce pollution uh, more quickly. The good news is it's working. Um, we've got a cap that's slowly declining. We're generating this year $1 billion, which is a big number even for a big state like California. Next year, probably $2 billion, which again by state law have to be plowed back into uh, reducing emissions, like uh, investing in public transit as I watch one of your great buses, two of your great buses go by. Um, like uh, investing in affordable housing near, near transit, um, walkable, bikeable uh, cities, rebates for electric cars, et cetera. And also our consumers receive a $70 uh, dollar credit on their electricity bill uh, once each year. Another key piece of our greenhouse gas emission reduction is a renewable portfolio standard, which is a fancy way to say we have a law that will require by 2020, this middle, this middle graphic, that a third of our energy in, in produced in California is renewable. And importantly, in, in your context, we do not count large hydro as renewable. Um, so uh, you all are a very clean uh, uh, energy system and are blessed with, obviously, abundant water. And, we're, and we have large hydro, but we're really holding ourselves on the, on the renewable portfolio standard to solar, wind, geothermal, et cetera. And as I'll talk about in a little bit, our 2030 goal is up to 50%. So what has this uh, resulted in? I, I like to show photos to show that it's actually real. This is the world's largest solar thermal power plant. Uh, 360,000 little mirrors reflect the light to these towers that then uh, burn so hot they create steam that turns a turbine enough to power a city of 300,000 uh, residents uh, operational on the Nevada-California border. World's largest uh, array of what's called solar uh, thin foam, which is technology of solar photovoltaic, uh, 550 megawatts, uh, could power a city of about 400,000. World's largest wind project. This, uh, this project would power a city of a million people. Geothermal, taking advantage of the Earth's uh, naturally occurred, uh, occurring heat in certain places. Uh, also large, uh, about three quarters of a million uh, population can be uh, powered by this. And just yet another solar technology, solar trout technology, uh, big, big project. So the renewable portfolio standard is actually created uh, projects in California, but also importantly distributed generation. Uh, because if you're a student of renewable energy and the transition we have to make, you, you, you know that it's not about necessarily uh, creating power in distant places and then creating a transmission infrastructure to bring the power. It's about uh, generating power where you live. We're very proud that over a quarter of new homes in Southern California are actually uh, being built with solar. So it's about renewable energy, but it's also deepening energy efficiency. And this is really a legacy we're proud of since Governor Brown's first term. And this is um, a graph you see on the right. And the, and the red line is uh, Americans' uh, per capita energy usage, uh, electri uh, electricity uh, usage over time. And the blue, which starts on the left and then is sort of this blue or gray uh, bar, the bottom part of that is California's per capita use. Currently, Californians uh, consume a uh, little over half of the electricity of an average American. It's not because we wear sweaters inside and suffer through uh, cold temperatures in the winter. Uh, it's not because we have some technologies that other states don't have. It's because California in the 1970s started um, putting in place building efficiency standards for new homes that require that new homes being built be built more efficient. And same thing with uh, uh, household appliances like refrigerators, washers and dryers, et cetera. California's market size um, enabled California policymakers to say, look, companies, if you want to sell your, your products in California, you have to abide these standards. 
and now we're on a consumer electronics. We just passed actually a efficiency standard for um, the plug for your phone. Um, and believe it or not, reduce by half the amount of energy um, that, that, that uh, is needed for that phone. You ever take out the plug from the wall and it's hot? So that's wasted energy. That's uh, the, th the technology companies being lazy about their designs. In California, and we're, we're proud to be partnering with the British uh, Columbian uh, provincial government uh, on this, we're uh, putting in place uh, efficiency standards uh, to maximize efficiency. So uh, that's part of our story. 40% of our greenhouse gas pollution in California comes from cars. We have 31 million cars in California. If we're gonna reach that, uh, that 2050 goal, it's all about electrifying transportation. To do that, we obviously have to uh, vastly scale up our amount of electric vehicles. Uh, I think as was mentioned in the, in the introduction, California actually passed a law a couple decades, decades ago, again, we could do it because of the scale of our economy, that said major auto manufacturers, General Motors, Toyota, Honda, if you wanna sell cars in California, you have to offer consumers the choice of buying a zero emission vehicle. Well, the car company said impossible, you ruined the industry, they litigated for a decade and a half, they ultimately lost. And guess what happened? They produced beautiful cars, the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Volt, on and on. And they're now available to California consumers. We have a goal of, uh, by 2025, uh, every uh, uh, six cars, one of them will be an electric vehicle. Now, that, you might not, that might not seem terribly ambitious, but it's actually quite challenging to transition people from using gasoline vehicles to using electric cars. We're also uh, building high-speed rail. 22 countries in the world have successful high-speed rail systems. A lot of people in the United States and California think, ah, Americans can't figure out trains. We're not gonna be able to do it here. Some of you chuckle because you probably agree. Um, but, uh, but I tell you what, in California, we're gonna make it happen because our population is growing from 38 million to 50 million people. The busiest short haul air route in the United States is Northern California to Southern California. If we don't actually build a high-speed rail and make it successful, we're talking about expanding uh, airports in Southern California and Northern California, very expensive, environmentally damaging, widening highways, et cetera. And so this is a big uh, initiative of, of Governor Brown's and one that he, he, he basically uh, suffers a lot of criticism for because of skepticism that we can get it done. And then the good news and, the, and what we love to talk about, especially in a, in a crowd like this, is we are not, uh, tackling climate change uh, despite the economy, we are tackling climate change because of the economy. And we believe we are actually making a strong um, strategic economic decision uh, in our state's economic future, save, saving the world from climate change, uh, because the energy industry, renewable, clean tech, is growing throughout the world, and we want the California uh, to be the, the birthplace of companies like Tesla, the two photos that you see took a factory that had been used by GM, Toyota, shuttered for a decade. Uh, conventional wisdom suggested auto manufacturing is never gonna happen in California because it's too expensive to do business there. Tesla came as a startup electric car company, is now employing 11,000 people uh, at this factory and, uh, and adding people every day. And what's even more remarkable is, not only has California's economic growth and our recovery from the recent recession outpaced the rest of the country, but within our economy, the sector growing fastest is the clean tech economy. And again, um, California's economy is not small, so it's not like a boutique economy where it could only happen in certain conditions. This is happening in the seventh largest economy in the world. As a result of this, uh, of this activity, California is drawing almost half of all of the investment in, in the United States in clean tech is coming to California. Looking to the future, this is Governor Brown giving his uh, fourth and last inaugural address, and he surprised a lot of people, including half of his staff, by basically writing his own speech, and, um, which he does all the time. That wasn't the surprise. Surprise was actually his goals. We will be, by 2030, 50% renewable. We will reduce our petroleum use in California by half, and we will double the energy efficiency savings of our existing buildings, which is the toughest nut to crack on energy efficiency existing buildings, uh, in half by 2030. And by the way, we're gonna adopt a new, new legal target for greenhouse gas emissions, up to 40% reduction by 2030. If we're really gonna talk the talk towards getting to 2050. So this all sounds great, but it's not a cakewalk. Um, similar probably to BC and Ontario, Every, every policy step uh, is contested. These are images actually from this fall 
um, when we were expanding our cap and trade program to bring fuels under the cap, oil refiners, of which we have a lot of in the state. And uh, fossil fuel industry um, seeded uh, about seven or eight organizations, uh, so-called grassroots organizations. Our speaker of the legislature called them AstroTurf, which may be a term you have up here. And they held uh, uh, rallies like this, stop the hidden gas tax. Um, particularly um, problematic or possibly offensive about this is really targeting um, uh, communities of color, minority communities um, in, in this, um, and, and really making this about uh, government taking it out on our community. No attack was bigger than in 2010 when there was an existential threat to California's climate leadership. And, and it was a ballot measure of which we have a lot of in each ballot in California. And it was put on by two oil companies, Valero and Tesoro, two Texas-based companies, received a bunch of funding from Coke Industries. If you follow this world, you know that name. Um, and they came to California and did enough public opinion research to think that they could actually get Californians to say, nope, now is not the cl time for climate leadership. And this was very scary to people that actually care about uh, climate leadership, air pollution, et cetera. So what happened? Oh, I should just mention one thing, which is kind of amazing. Now, this is the first commercial, television commercial, statewide media buy in California. You're talking millions of bucks. Of course, the, the, the logos of those three entities was nowhere to be found uh, on a television commercial. It was a woman sitting at her kitchen table um, with her head in her hands trying to figure out her family's finances and essentially blaming her, her family's inability uh, to make ends meet on California's environmental policy. That was the rhetoric, environment versus economy. And this is what happened. Um, really, an unprecedented coalition came together, um, which vastly uh, expanded uh, beyond environmental groups. Um, much like Lois, in, Lois mentioned in, in uh, Ontario, the American Lung Association, the Heart Association, American Medical Association, Nurses Union, labor trade groups, um, the electrical workers, the laborers, uh, communities of color. It was remarkable uh, in, in coming together of interests um, and really interests of the people in many respects uh, to push back on this uh, external threat to California's uh, climate leadership. And here's what happened. In this case, red is the good, the good color uh, because it's the, it's the number of folks that voted no uh, or it's the counties that went no on uh, Prop 23, which would have rolled back AB 32. Uh, Prop 23 lost by over 20% of the vote. And the conventional wisdom, as the New York Times uh, suggested, is um, new energy you know, outfoxed old energy. And it was this real coming together of a democratic movement. So key lessons of Prop 23 as we look in, in, um, back in retrospect, you know, it's not about the graph that I showed at the beginning. It's not about, I mean, in terms of really building the movement, um, while it's important, you know, while the melting ice sheet in, in, um, in Antarctica or in uh, Antarctica and I guess both poles is important, um, while endangered species loss in different parts of the world is important, we found with Prop 23, and this is when I was outside of government working for the environmental group, is you link it to people. You link it to the health because the same tailpipe or the same uh, uh, smokestacks that are emitting carbon emissions are emitting criteria air pollutants, localized pollution um, that causes childhood asthma, premature deaths, et cetera. Link it to jobs and show that, that the clean tech uh, economy is growing jobs. Amazing fact in California, more people are now employed putting up solar panels on rooftops than employed by all of the electrical utilities in the state. Amazing fact, and that's real. Make it about people, tell the stories of people. Um, because certainly the opponents tried to make it about people, but those, but those stories were, in, in, they, they didn't ring true like the, like the speaker at uh, one of the many rallies in the Central Valley in an area that suffers from endemic air pollution and very high rates of childhood asthma. Um, bring it to people on a level that they relate to, and it is a future versus past. That's a little bit rhetorical, but we found in California that people really connect with this idea that we need to, we can't just protect the, what, what's in the past, we need to prepare for the future. So where to go from here? I've told the story of California and how, how excited we are in California, but the fact remains, we like to remind ourselves in California, we comprise less than 1% of, of carbon pollution or greenhouse gas emissions in the world. If you add our region, Oregon, Washington, and BC, it's less than 2%. So how do we actually uh, achieve an, an international action and ultimately a planetary solution on global, uh, global warming? It can seem daunting, but I share with you uh, a couple of thoughts. As, as Lois pointed out, 
uh, acid rain. I grew up in Michigan, um, not far from Ontario. Uh, I remember this being talked about as the intractable issue of our generation is acid rain, uh, killing lakes, uh, you know, uh, harming people. And now, you know, 25 years on, um, major progress to the point where, um, I don't want to say we've totally resolved it, but we've largely resolved it. Take an international case, uh, also daunting, the growing hole in, in the ozone layer. Um, daunting at its time, required international action, and believe it or not, that international action came in the form of the Montreal Protocol, which was an international agreement to phase out the uh, chemicals and the use of chemicals that created the hole in the first place. So this can be done. What are we doing outside of our borders in California? Well, first, we're actually working with your government, which is a real leader we look to uh, on these topics, in Washington and Oregon. In many ways, BC and California share more in common in terms of their political and environmental values than we do with the states and provinces back east. And we recognize this. We think about ourselves as a region with 54 million people, um, a vast GDP that represents the fifth largest economy in the world. So if we can do it with the fifth largest economy in the world, isn't that a powerful model uh, to, the, to the rest of the planet? And by the way, our clean economy is growing from, from BC to California, and we're going to reap the economic benefits of that environmental leadership. As, a, as a, the most concrete example of what we're doing together, these are uh, four leaders, your environment minister, Mary Pollack, uh, Premier Clark couldn't be in San Francisco for the signing, but this is an agreement that they signed, which is the action plan on climate and energy. And sometimes these multilateral agreements can be long on words and short on actions, but I can tell you that this plan is the real deal in that for the first time, these four leaders all agreed to work together to price carbon, which isn't big news in DC, or California, because we have it, but very big news in Oregon and Washington where they stepped up to say, we're going to do it to create a, a, a regional effort to price carbon. Um, a clean fuel standard or a low carbon fuel standard, which you have in BC, we have in California, requires that by 2020, um, fuel have 10% less of the carbon content than it did um, when the regulations took place. Very important. Um, a, a plan towards ultimately net zero buildings through deepening energy efficiency, electric car expansion, the whole flip side of, of climate action, which is uh, adapting to the inexorable climate uh, change that will exist even if we clean up our act in the coming decade. And then lastly, actually speaking with one voice um, in international forums. The big international forum, which I hope the panel will talk about, is happening later in this year uh, in Paris. It's the Conference of Parties, which is the international negotiation um, that the UN framework set up. And it's really the next, and depending on who you listen to, possibly the last uh, or near the last opportunity for the international community to come together for nation states to actually commit to binding reductions in greenhouse gas emissions um, to really uh, stem uh, planetary climate change. In advance of that, uh, our region, our leaders are actually uh, working to make their voice heard that this can be done. It's not a question of if it can be done, it's when it can be done beyond uh, the Northwest region. So I'm very excited to be here and look forward to learning from the panel. And uh, thank you to the Suzuki Foundation for all you do. Wade, thank you for a tremendous presentation. And thank you, Lois, as well. Um, Wade, I, I took from your presentation the theme of cooperation whether it was among states and provinces or whether it was among different stakeholders within the state of California. So I think there's a lot we can learn and, and now we're gonna learn uh, quite a bit because we've got four BC leaders uh, with, that are gonna join our panel right now. Um, I'm going to welcome up to the stage David Beers who's gonna moderate our panel. David Beers is the founding editor of the TAI uh, David was the senior editor at the Vancouver Sun or, or played a senior editor role at the Vancouver Sun uh, Mother Jones, the San Francisco Examiner, and has won national honors for his writing and editing in Canada and the United States. David also founded the Taiyi Solution Society, a nonprofit that seeks philanthropic support for journalism in the public interest, and he is an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia uh, for the School of Journalism, and he is the author of the memoir, Blue Sky Dream. So thank you, David, for taking on the role as moderator. And mod uh, David will introduce the panelists. Thank you. 
And I invite the speakers to come up here. Thanks, Ian. You see me running up here because I know we don't, we're on a tight schedule. I will say that Blue Sky Dream is a memoir of growing up in Silicon Valley because that's where I grew up. And while I was in uh, university, um, we had this governor named Jerry Brown. Very cool guy. Very much ahead of his time. He was reading people like Barry Commoner and E.F. Schumacher. So was I. Um, even though we looked the same right now, I was much younger than him at the time. <laughs> and um, I just want to point out one thing that kind of relates to the question is how democracies can solve climate change. Jerry Brown, um, I, if I have it right, he, re he came in after a guy named Ronald Reagan and then um, Pete Wilson, right, came, who uh, was kind of a Reagan light, comes in after him. So what we have here is an indication that um, Jerry Brown did some heavy lifting in the late 70s, early 80s, but there was an intellectual and activist community at the time when he was not able to be governor for a while. Um, the movements continued, the conversations continued, and that created a space for him to then be elected and make good on some of these ideas that take quite a long time in gestating. So I take some hope from that. Um, somebody, a colleague today asked me, um, what's the name of this uh, panel you're talking about? And I said, uh, how democracies can solve climate change. And she said, well, of course democracies can solve climate change. That's why we're not solving climate change. We don't have a democracy. <laughs> so I don't, that's a certain, there's a certain level of skepticism about the whole premise out there. And maybe the question is, how, what can our ability or inability to solve climate change tell us about the quality of our democracy at the moment? I think that's kind of what we're gonna talk about. Um, in a version of, we've heard of speed dating, we're gonna have speed debating because uh, I think we have about 40 minutes for four people to share ideas and that's, do the math, okay? So I'm gonna very quickly introduce them up here and uh, then while you're up here, then I will give your bio. So could Kathy Harrison, Sapporo Berman, Mike Harcourt, and Andy Reimer all come on up. And there's stairs over here, or steps over here, on both sides. Have a seat, I don't, there's no name tags. Mike, how are yeah, you? Good, good, to, good, see good you. to see you, man. <laughs> good. Find a chair and I'm here. Sure, if the speakers want to come up, okay, so that's six. <laughs> six into 40, so you do the further <laughs> math, okay. That was great. Yeah, that was really exciting. And somebody take that center chair, because I'm here. <laughs> Go ahead, Andrea. I'm wearing a skirt. Okay. <laughs> Get cozy, I want to thank Shane, because I was standing next right. to Jeff well, Dembecki, and we've worked together for we seven years, together. but we've never held hands before. So thank you so much for making that happen tonight. It was a wonderful thing for both of us. So be comfortable. Somebody take that center chair. It's just too weird to not have that okay, table. Okay, okay. thanks. All right, sitting in the center chair is Kathy Harrison. <laughs> Yay! Speed, you know, got to keep moving through that. Okay, teaches in the Department of uh, Political Science at UBC. And her research focuses on environmental policy. She is a recognized expert on the global no, politics of climate change. And she can help us think through the challenges of climate action from a public policy perspective. We have Sapora Berman there in the middle on the far couch. And she's one of the most prominent environmental leaders in Canada. She's also an author and co-founder of Forest Ethics. And she can speak to the issues of advocacy and campaigning. Mike Harcourt is the former mayor of Vancouver and premier of British Columbia. He is the CEO of Quest, Quality Urban Energy Systems of Tomorrow, and a member of the Eco-Fiscal Commission. Mike can speak to the role of cities and also draw on his vast leadership experience. And then we have Andrea Reimer, who is uh, Vancouver's deputy mayor. She's worked on both the Greenest City Initiative and the Engaged City Task Force, and she's in a good position um, even though kind of in a squeezed in position <laughs> to relate the issue of climate change and democracy to things that are happening right here in our backyard. And of course we have Wade and Lois as well. So um, I'm gonna just um, start in with some questions and see how it goes. Um, 
Uh, Wade's given us an overview of California's climate change laws and how political support was built in the face of industry-backed opposition. Lois has talked about the phase out of, of coal in Ontario and that province's green energy and green economy acts. So Pora, what are, what are the lessons here for advocacy and citizen engagement? What were you hearing in their presentations that resonated with what you've done? Well, I, I, I know both examples pretty well. Um, and I think um, in, in both Ontario and California, um, there were extremely robust citizens engagement and advocacy campaigns that ensured that there was support for decision makers when they're making the hard decisions and, and that there was also gonna be consequences for inaction if you got a, you know, a different administration in. So in Ontario, and so two things here I think. The advocacy campaigns that we saw in both Ontario and California were about building power. They weren't just um, education, they were mm -hmm. about motivating citizens to engage so that the issues became vote determinative. They were the hard organizing work, the knocking on doors, the, you know, the getting people out uh, to events, um, engaging people both through the tactics that were used, but also engaging people through the communications. And both of you talked a little bit about co-benefits, not just talking about climate change, but talking about things that matter to people in their homes um, and in their lives. And the health impacts of coal in Ontario, I know a lot of the work in that advocacy campaign was built around that. A lot of the work in the Green Energy um, Act campaign was focused on the economic benefits. Uh, the Green Belt campaign, which also you didn't talk about very much, but is, was a big part of the shift that we saw in Ontario, was really about painting a vision uh, for the future for people. It was about talking to people about how they could have better transit and a, and a, you know, and, and a, a healthy lifestyle. And so I think localizing the issues was really important. Communications that engage and, and building power um, was, you know, it, sometimes it sounds invisible because we often talk about shiny people doing important things, you know, but, but there's the grunt work of social change, which mm -hmm. is about really good organizing and the hard work of those campaigns that really made a lot of this possible. So thank you. So co-benefits. Um, Kathy, I know that's something that you look at quite a bit. Um, um, is it easier to build political support when there are co-benefits? And um, in the case of climate change, uh, what are some of the co-benefits that we should be looking for now here in British Columbia's context? Well, Sephora has already spoken about some of this, and I think mm -hmm. one of the things that was particularly important in Ontario, but also in California, were the, the immediate health benefits of mm -hmm. um, cleaning up local air quality by reducing reliance on fossil fuels. And you know, there was a period of, in southwestern Ontario when I would go back and visit London, where I grew up, and you know, my friends were worried about their kids practicing soccer. And so when the environment was number one, uh, the sort of top of mind issue in Canada from late 2006 till mid 2008, the environmental issue that was top of mind was air quality. And so I think that that was very important, but there's a lot of other um, issues that people care about that can be connected to climate change. Um, uh, the uh, local jobs, creation of local jobs, where you know, depending on the nature of the economy, reducing reliance on fossil fuels reduces reliance on imported goods and substitutes locally produced um, energy. Mm -hmm. So solar and wind tend to be installed close, mm -hmm. close to the location and that's, um, various studies have shown that that's particularly important um, in uh, motivating certain US states. And I guess the last thing I would say is that this isn't just a North American phenomenon. There's been um, a relatively recent study done by the IMF, by Ian Perry, that found that the, the sort of cost benefit analysis of acting on climate change dramatically shifts towards quicker action mm -hmm. if you take into account the um, concurrent benefits for public health. And in fact, those benefits alone in many countries justify immediate action even if you weren't worried about climate change. Before I ask questions to the next, I just want to double back a bit on this co-benefits idea since it's something the two of you have addressed. So in the last election, it wasn't about health issues. And whenever jobs were talked about, the jobs, after a while, the jobs ended up being associated with growing um, our petro um, economy, yeah. expanding um, uh, fracking and LNG. And I'm just wondering if there's something fundamentally different about BC as being a resource-based economy, boom-bust, 
um, where we're not able to tap into that kind of polyglot economic vision that somebody that Jerry Brown can present to all of California. You know, we're a, we're a, we're a huge economy here in California. We make things, we implement things, we, 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 we design and, 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 and install. Whereas I find BC very quickly during election cycles falls into a very familiar narrative. We pull things out of the ground and sell them raw to the rest of the world. So as much as I see there's a, an affinity between the two places, mm -hmm. I wonder if the co-benefits message gets swamped here by the, by the resource message. Am I wrong about that? Or? Well, it, it, it does, in yeah. part because of entrenched power. You mm -hmm. don't have opinion leaders that are quite ready to step up to the plate and start mm -hmm. talking about um, or start taking stance, stances, for example, against the pipelines. You, mm -hmm. you don't have the business leaders you've had in Ontario or California. We actually have more jobs in clean tech and clean energy in BC than we do in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. They're new jobs. And often when you talk to those new leaders, well, we're new to BC and we don't want to necessarily want to, you know, speak out against the pipeline because it's, you know, so we're, we're actually seeing that the clean tech and clean energy leaders are reticent to step up to the plate in that debate and we're, and then, and then the in, entrenched power mm -hmm. is very much entrenched in the past in, in the oil and gas, in forestry, et cetera, and then that resource-based economy. But I think advocacy groups have made a huge mistake in Canada by not focusing more on campaigns for solutions. We're really clear mm -hmm. in Canada knowing what we're against. We're not mm -hmm. very good about talking about what we're for. Mm -hmm. And we really saw a lot of those great campaigns in California for electric vehicles, um, plug-in electric, you know, put solar on it, you know, really populist, pop popular campaigns that show that it's happening now. You know, I find in the environmental movement in Canada when we talk about the good stuff, we talk about it as though it's something off in the future instead of talking yeah. about it how it's happening right now. And we don't create tangible proposals for people to rally around. And Kathy, did you wanna? I guess I'll add something that, that, that's mm -hmm. um, quite different and that's that I think there's a certain hypocrisy in BC's climate mm -hmm. leadership in that one of our major pr products that we produce most of the last 10 years, our number one export has been coal. Mm -hmm. We just don't burn it ourselves. We <laughs> send it to someone else to get burned. The amount of coal the amount of CO2 that will be released from the coal that British Columbia is exporting is considerably more than the greenhouse gases for the whole province mm -hmm. every year. So I do think there's something special going that we can conveniently look the other way mm -hmm. because when we're digging up that particular fossil fuel, we're not burning it. Thank you. All right. Um, Mike, how important is uh, political, political leadership then? And, uh, what kind of leadership is needed? Um, I know you've done a lot of cross-partisan work at the uh, Eco-Fiscal Commission. Well, I think the first uh, two speakers showed what political leadership can do. I mean, that was obvious in uh, Ontario, uh, starting with Dalton McGinty and carried on by Catherine, and uh, Jerry Brown, and uh, just very determined, clear, focused, gutsy leadership. Uh, so it's absolutely essential. If you don't have it, uh, you're, you're, you're laboring mightily to try and mobilize people, and, and it's, it's really hard. So you have to have good political leadership. <clears throat> and I, I despair about people that despair about democracy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it really pisses me off if I could be, and That's because you know, you're in the democracy business. You no, know? oh, democracy, <laughs> de democracy can work if you make it work. If you don't like it, change it. If you don't like the parties that are there, get new parties. I mean, this city did that. In 1969 to 1972, we told the same planner that designed Los Angeles, you know, the same plan we had for the city of Vancouver here, Harlan Bartholomew. It was based on the, uh, you know, the, that, that same, if your freeways fill up, build more. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's a disaster. And so we said, uh, when I had long flowing hair like David Suzuki. <laughs> <laughs> that, hi neighbor, how you doing? <laughs> Love that bike crew day. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, we weren't going to let that freeway that was going to come across the North Shore, go along Stanley Park, elevated along our waterfront, wipe out gas down in Chinatown, and destroy Strathcona, Grandview Woodlands, and uh, Hastings East to connect up to the Trans Canada Highway. And then we're going to take out all those neighborhoods and replace them with low-income, 
public housing, high rises. Now you can think of a more horrific uh, thing that could have happened in the city, and we stopped it. Mm -hmm. And we started a whole different way of thinking about cities. The livable city before, it's now called the greenest city or the most sustainable city. Sustainability has become built into the uh, ethos of the city of Vancouver. And I think that that showed up when we had an election <clears throat> between two tall, slim, millionaire, bike riding, uh, <laughs> <laughs> morality candidate. And the contest was who's green and who's greener, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So it's, it's part of us. And because we had the guts to make those kinds of decisions and to replace the NPA or the totally partisan association, <laughs> oh, as come I on call them. <laughs> I thought you were the nonpartisan guy. Come on. <laughs> Never. <laughs> we were able to transform this city to being the only city in North America that doesn't have a freeway going through it. Yeah. So political leadership is absolutely essential. And I think we were able to yeah. build on that provincially because of the incredible leadership of Gro Harlan Brundtland. The Norwegian, the former uh, prime minister of Norway, prime minister, yeah, who who coined who, the term sustainability. She guess, coined right? the term sustainable yeah. development, and yeah. she wrote a book called Our Common Future, yeah. which became the backbone when I was running for premier, and we were running to uh, <coughs> replace Bill Vandersham and his fantasy gardens view of the province, um, and we succeeded because we had a very clear vision based on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that we're going to protect 12% of the provinces, mm -hmm. at least 12% of the provinces, significant ecological areas. We were going to move to uh, far less of a cut in the forest. We were going to move to sustainable forest practices, settle with the First Nations people for the first time in our history, and a whole series of integrated sustainability mm -hmm. practices. Because of her leadership, we were able to do that. So, uh, you know, I, I think that politics is absolutely essential to making the kind of changes we need to make if we're going to deal with climate change and we're going to deal with something I'll talk about later but, on. But if I, if I hear you right, part of political leadership is having your radar operating so that you can pick up that political leadership is happening as far away as in Norway or in the United Nations and being able to figure out how that narrative of leadership might work in your own context. Yeah, yeah and there's incredible uh, leadership happening all over. I just got back, well not just got back, but a, a while ago I went to Sweden. And Sweden was on the edge of ruin when the OPEC uh, cartel decided to put in a boycott, raised dramatically the price of oil. And Sweden was totally dependent on oil. They decided then and there from the Prime Minister down through the 30 counties, through the 400 municipalities, they were going to take 30 years to change that, and they have. Sweden has, uh, in their 400 municipalities, they have community energy systems for heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. They recycle and utilize 99% of their garbage. The other 1% goes into an abandoned uh, mining pit off the coast of Norway, or it goes into making... Uh, asphalt. So they have a new goal that they're going to be totally independent of Vladimir Putin and oil and the Saudis. They're going to be totally independent of oil for transportation by 2030. I have to wrap you up pretty quickly. Yeah, here, but I'm so just saying there's yeah. a lot of good examples of success right. <clears throat> that we heard from our two great speakers one, before and, and, the, and elsewhere. One of the things that I here there was something that I gathered from both of your great presentations, which was the 30-year vision. Mm -hmm. It's not something that, as Catherine would point out and as Max pointed out, politicians live or die by 30-year cycles. So it takes a brave politician to lay out a 30-year plan, but look what got done in 30 years in Ontario. Look what you're halfway to getting done in, in California on a 30-year plan. So, so if we can begin to to be able to um, construct democratic processes that support and empower 30-year plans, maybe we can achieve these things. Um, Deputy Mayor um, Reimer, let me ask you this. Is uh, the city of Vancouver is opposed to the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion? And of course, we want everything to be nonpartisan and inclusive because we're all part of the great transition story. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> is there any way that Kinder Morgan could get a social license to operate in Vancouver? What would they have to do? Well, 
I would think it's important <laughs> to remember that Kinder Morgan's had a social license to operate in Vancouver for 50 some odd years. The pipeline mm -hmm. was built in 1953 in part because of resident desire to have locally refined um, oil and have access to gas that wasn't moving through mm -hmm. other means. And there's actually a huge celebration in Vancouver the day that pipeline opened because it was the better alternative at the time. Um, the pipeline was built, though, for at the time that it was built, it was carrying 50,000 barrels of oil a day solely to serve the Pacific Northwest. Um, it could go up to a capacity of 120,000, which would be more than enough for our current local needs. Where the license got broken was when Kinder Morgan decided to start ramping up exports. Um, so, so that was the first one, without any permits or approvals, which they're supposed to get from the, the federal government. Um, now they want a six-fold increase of that at a very time when we have a city of Vancouver with a Greenest City Action Plan, this long-term vision, um, that says by the year 2050 there will be no burning of fossil fuels in the city of Vancouver. And if, if we're successful in working on this, hopefully nowhere on the planet, because that's what the science says that we need to do if we're going to have a reasonable chance of success at getting climate change down to a level where we can we can survive it, essentially. So I don't foresee them getting the social license to expand the pipeline, but understanding that we have an economy, we have a social structure, we have um, a city and a region that rely on fossil fuels today, the question we've put to them and really tried to work with them on is how fast can we get to a world where these aren't necessities? Great. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, Lois, can I bring you in on this? Um, I'd invite you to make any comments you'd like related to what you've heard, but if you don't have any, I might have a question for you. I was thinking about uh, something that Mike said, and I was talking to a class about two weeks ago, I guess, in organic chemistry at the University of New Brunswick, um, and I was walking them through some molecules and famous molecules um, like CO2 and uh, <laughs> the Mickey Mouse molecule, water, <laughs> and, um, oh, now I've forgotten, the Aaron Brockovich mo molecule. Can anyone help me with that one? Hydro hi hi uh, blah, blah, blah. Hexavalent chromium. There we go. And I said that, you know, really organic chemistry is just change over time under pressure. <laughs> 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 and that's sort of what activism and politics <laughs> is all about, too, isn't it? Change over time under pressure. So I, like, I'm, I'm committed, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm the most optimi optimistic on climate change. I'm more optimistic this year than I was last year. How's that? I mean, the fact is our economies are proving that you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and grow. So it's not a question of finding a, a new technology or making a bunch of very um, unattractive compromises. It can be done. Uh, and so I, I share Lois's optimism. Uh, for this year. It's an important year. And in our country, we were very excited to see a breakthrough with China. Uh, because without getting too deep into the international politics of climate change, develop, the developed world, the so-called developed world, the rich countries, um, are in a, in a tough place asking poorer countries that are trying to bring people out of poverty yeah. to simply stop polluting. Uh, because our, we, we've achieved the standard of living that we have through reliance on fossil fuel for centuries. So the, the, bre the, the, uh, the breakthrough of China as a leading developing economy and the United States as a leading developed economy, I think are really a uh, cause for some level of optimism. Great. I'm going to wrap up with a question that it's the same question I'll put to each of you, and that is um, cast yourself now in the role of, of, the, of a doctor of democracy. I have brought the patient to you, the body politic and the various germs who are trying to invade and poison the body politic. What, how do you diagnose, what, 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 is, what do, you, do you diagnose as the, the first order of business, the, the main problem facing our democracies today in tackling climate change, and what might you prescribe? You don't have to, uh, it doesn't have to be so practical that it can happen tomorrow, but if you were able to inject the body politic with the, with the proper the proper medicine. What would you What would you prescribe? Should we start with Catherine, since this is your? 
I'm kind you're of a doctor of democracy. You're a doctor of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to claim it. Yeah. Um, I don't know that this is the most important one, but I yeah. think it's one that comes to mind that's relevant yeah. to both the Ontar uh, Ontario and California cases, and that's I applaud subnational leadership. Um, California in particular has mm -hmm. come up with really novel policies, low carbon fuel standard, mm -hmm. uh, clean energy standard, renewable portfolio standard, those are spreading. I, I applaud the guts that it takes to do hard things. Um, but what we see is that the subnational jurisdictions that are showing the most leadership are already the cleanest. Mm -hmm. And if we look at Canada, we actually have two Canadas. There's sort of all the provinces that have per capita emissions that sort of 18 and below, and then we have two provinces that are 60 and 70 tons per person per year, um, Alberta and Saskatchewan. And one of those accounts for almost all the emissions growth. And that's why I'm kind of skeptical that, that you know, Alberta's going to go, gee, I love that story that you guys <laughs> told. And so I have two, two things that, right. that I can see happening. One of them is that there's no substitute for national standards. We need leadership at the yeah. national level yeah. that can take advantage of what's happened. Well, we saw that in the California, in the California example, yeah. where they, they can the set cars. standards and make industry mm -hmm. suddenly innovate where they wouldn't have. Yeah. And the other possibility is we've seen subnational governments saying yes that they've been mm -hmm. doing important things, and I think the second step may be for subnational governments to say no and block some of the unsustainable activities. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see that with respect to the the pipelines across mm -hmm. BC. Um, resistance to the East-West pipeline, um, resistance to Keystone XL in the U.S. So, you know, if the fossil fuel intensive jurisdictions want to keep going, the rest of the subnational governments have to say it's just not fair to the rest of us that all of this hard work is being undone. Very good. Dr. Reimer? <laughs> First and only time Consulting someone will say physician. that to me. Um, well, I guess if you want to fix a problem, you have to diagnose what that problem is. Right. And I, I did take some exception to two of the, the statements that you were making around the narrative we tell ourselves in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, so the co-benefits, how many times have we heard we must have Kinder Morgan because we need the jobs, right? They're always selling those co-benefits. We need LNG so we can pay for health care, right? This, this is the story. It's the same story we're telling on green issues. We just haven't done it as successfully here. And our, our elections have not been entirely resource-based. You had a uh, BC Liberal government reelected twice now with the carbon tax, as pointed out, a globally ambitious, although perhaps not scientifically as high as it needs to be, um, and a city leadership here in Vancouver that's been elected three times on an incredibly clear, strong mandate around being the greenest city in the world. So it, the problem isn't necessarily that we're too resource focused or we don't get co-benefits. What these examples, California, Vancouver, the BC carbon tax, the Ontario have in common is four things. You've got a leader who's willing to lead. Not just anyone who's willing to lead, but the leader, the premier, the governor, the mayor who is willing to step up and take that leadership and has a clear vision about what they're for, not just what they're against. You've got a plan. So some is not a number, soon is not a time. You have clear targets and there is a clear date by which you intend to meet those targets. You've got partnerships. Here in Vancouver, um, 35,000 residents. We have members of our Greenest City Action Team, David Cadman, David Suzuki, Mike Harcourt, another uh, 13 folks, plus 35,000 residents and 180 organizations that were involved in the plan. So it's not me defending the plan. It's 35,000 residents that are defending the plan when we go to an election or have to move those um, specific actions forward. And the last thing, which is really important, is action, right? Once we've done all the leading and the planning and the partnering, we don't always remember to act. And that these actions, whether they be enabling the small ones by individual residents or the big ones by collaborations between local, regional, national, provincial governments and across borders, um, we need to show residents that we're not just prepared to talk, but we're prepared to take tough actions at the level they understand the problem to be. Great. So we have, um, by my accounting, we have about six minutes max left. So Sephora and Mike, you get three each. So you begin planning your three. Sephora, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Shoo! <laughs> On democracy in Canada right now, three minutes, okay. Um, you know, a democracy only functions if you have three things. If you have transparency, if you have information and education, and if you have engagement. And what we've seen in the last eight years is a dramatic erosion of all three. 
We don't have transparency in this country. We have no debate on um, big omnibus bills like C-38 or C-51 or C-45 where you have 70 to 100 laws changed at one time with no public debate whatsoever. Um, we have freedom information documents that now show that behind closed doors um, there have been deals cut between our government and the oil industry to change the laws. So we lost 70 environmental laws in this country with Bill C-38 and freedom of information documents showed that it was because the oil industry asked for those changes, word for word. Information, well, 2,000 scientists have been fired in the last eight years by the federal government. Um, we have shut down the National Roundtable on Environment and Economy, the Experimental Lakes Initiative. Scientists who still work for the government are muzzled. And then on engagement, the energy board processes are restricted so heavily that the public can't participate. It is easier now in this country to become a Canadian citizen than it is to fill out the 11-page online form to participate in the National Energy Board hearings. So it's very hard for the public to participate in a public process. And even when you do get in, you're not allowed to talk about climate change or upstream environmental impacts despite the fact that the National Energy Board was given the mandate to do environmental assessments when the government rolled that into C-38. So we have this incredible erosion. If we're going to get anything back and actually have a real conversation about climate change in this country, we need to have a medium for that conversation. You're not allowed to talk about climate change in the Energy Board hearings. You're not allowed to talk about climate change in the mine hearings. There is no place in this country right now to talk about climate change and to have a democratic debate <laughs> because the federal government has shut that down. So I, I think we need that to happen. We need to have a real conversation because we don't need these pipelines if we're making a decision to address climate change and move to a low carbon economy because we cannot meet our climate goals and expand the tar sands past, significantly past where they are today. We need to cap them, clean it up and transition out. And in order to do that, we have to have a real adult conversation with all sectors of society to figure out how to do it. Part of that is getting a, an agreement on our Canada versus their Canada. And our Canada places climate change and bold action and cities at the top of the agenda because it's cities where the consumption's happening. 50% of the climate of uh, greenhouse gases happen in our cities. 95% of Canadians live in 120 big medium cities. We are a highly urbanized uh, country. <clears throat> and 60% uh, of uh, energy is consumed in cities. And I would argue that the pulp mills and the uh, oil fields and that, where are they sending their, their uh, products to? They're sending them to people in cities. And the real frightening uh, challenge we have is that we're adding 4 billion more people to the planet since 2000 in cities. The urban tsunami, I call it. And, and if we don't deal with that fact that we're an urban species, homo urbanus, and we don't focus on cities as a starting point, flip the way we do government, not national governments, provinces, and cities. It's cities that are the place that people are, that's important to people. So if we start with cities and we have sustainable city strategies and we have community energy uh, plans, like Guelph does, like Vancouver's starting to move towards, uh, I think that's the starting point. That's the human scale that will allow us to grab people's attention, to engage on a scale that, that's comfortable enough for most people to be able to understand. The national international is way beyond what most people uh, want to be involved with. Their own community is the starting point for us to really come to grips with climate change. Thank you very much. And um, yeah. And we've come to the end of this session, so I'll just say from what I heard is that there are challenges, but uh, I personally am less, I never was despairing, but I'm less pessimistic than I was when I started. And um, we're seeing some great models of solutions within the democratic context. Um, obviously the work ahead of us is to build on these uh, lessons. The next panel is going to look at the transit plebiscite. Uh, it'll be moderated by, I believe, by uh, Jeff Dembecki here, who writes about uh, the, the climate change uh, economy, innovative economy. His series is um, called Are We Screwed, which seems to get right down to the point. <laughs> um, so I think he'll be a good moderator, and maybe he'll do a better job than me 
of leaving some time for the audience to ask questions. I apologize for that. Um, but it's been certainly a, a, a great panel and a great conversation so far. And uh, thanks, everybody, and enjoy the break. If I could remind everyone, we've got about 15 minutes. If you could be back in your seats in 15 minutes, we've got a, a rock star lineup for our second half. So thank you. Well, welcome back uh, for our final speaker and panel discussion. Um, and here's an example of some direct democracy in our own backyard, uh, the Van Metro Vancouver's transit and transportation plebiscite. So imagine if you could have a real impact on climate change in your region using nothing more than a pen. Wielding that kind of power is a reality right now in, Met in, in BC's lower mainland. Uh, but the opportunity certainly comes with risks. And to learn more about the importance of this decision, the opportunity as well as the risk, I would like to introduce Greg Moore, uh, the mayor of Port Coquitlam. Greg Moore is a lifelong resident of Port Coquitlam and is serving his third term as mayor. He previously served two terms as city councillor from 2002 to 2008. Among Mayor Moore's many appointments, including serving as chair of the City of Port Coquitlam's Finance and Intergovernmental Committee, he has also chaired the Metro Vancouver uh, Board of Directors and also was the former chair of the Metro Council on Regional Transportation and Investment Subplan Committee, which is the plan that uh, is before us, uh, to, uh, before us now uh, for the region. Certainly there are times in a region's history when it's necessary for pol politicians to move beyond their political interests and collaborate to create a broader vision for the region. Interesting, Mayor Moore has been one of the major forces spearheading efforts by the Mayor's Council on Regional Transportation to achieve just that. With 21 of the 24 Metro Vancouver mayors endorsing the recently released transportation plan, um, that's quite an amazing feat uh, in itself. The Mayor's Council on Regional Transportation Plan is a strong vision for how Metro Vancouver's transportation and transit system can develop to meet the needs of residents, businesses, and the broader regional economy while addressing climate change. And to learn more about this important decision, I'm grateful to welcome Mayor Greg Moore. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming this afternoon, this evening, I guess. And uh, it's my pleasure to talk about our plan and the, uh, the challenge that we have in front of us with this democracy process we have to go through. <laughs> First, we know this. We have a million more people coming to this region. It's something we say over and over and over again. But the reality is um, they're coming. They're not coming in 10 years from now. They're coming right now. In fact, uh, every year we add a city of Port Coquitlam to the region. And you're probably going, wow, Port Coquitlam, that small little suburb, that's not that many people. Well, we're 58,000 people now. So we're adding that to the region every single year. But this region has a long history of doing regional planning, actually. In fact, you know, as a regional district, we're celebrating, just celebrated our 100th year of delivering sewage services throughout this region. So there is a history of working together as a region. But if we look here, back in 1946, we had this plan about regional planning. Uh, and as we moved forward in 1963, we started to see the region grow beyond just the CBD and out through uh, into our suburbs. And then in 1975, we came forward with a strategic plan. And then in the mid-90s, we came forward with the Livable Region Strategic Plan our first regional growth strategy uh, in the, the mid-90s that really started to appreciate our green space, but also our urban core, uh, our town centers, so that we could then make sure that we're facilitating our planning as a region and not as 22 silos throughout the region. And then last year we came forward and over a few years, Mayor Corrigan brought forward the Metro 2040 plan, which is our new regional growth strategy, which talks about how we're going to accommodate the million more people around this region. And we use that document, as well as the regional transportation strategy, as a starting point to develop the mayor's transportation plan. So last year, uh, about January, we had gone through many years of frustration at the mayor's council, and we were challenged by the provincial government to come up with uh, a 30-year vision and a 10-year implementation strategy uh, for this region around transit and transportation. And so uh, 
So I was kind of a loud mouth around the table, and my friend here, Jeff Meggs, uh, said, I, you know, I nominate, I think Greg should lead this thing, and we should put some, you know, mayors from Vancouver and Surrey and the North Shore and, and uh, Richmond, um, uh, Surrey, and Coquitlam around there to represent the subregions and get together and develop this plan. And so we did that. I, I, I challenged my colleagues to say, you know what, in three months, we have the ability to create a document that will change this region for generations. We have, there is nothing more important in our last three year term than developing this plan. And what I asked out of each and every one of them was that they committed four or five hours every week for the next three months to develop the plan. And if you've ever tried to get a meeting with a mayor in the region, specifically a mayor of Vancouver or Surrey or something like that, it's pretty tough just to sort of say, hey, I'm gonna come in and I need five hours next week. But you know what, all of them committed to it. They changed their schedule, they dedicated their staff, the TransLink staff came together. Uh, we had, uh, I will say, I had a great time doing it. Uh, I love debating and challenging and differing with opinions uh, with these other mayors around the region, and it was a phenomenal experience. And we came out with a plan uh, last May that is the foundation of this plebiscite that we're in. Uh, and we had 21 of the 22 mayors around the region support the plan. And I can tell you as a politician, uh, you come out with a new policy statement, you hold your breath that three or four organizations are gonna get behind you and say, good job, you're on the right track. Well, the Better Transportation and Transit Coalition has 110 organizations, business, nonprofit groups supporting this plan for a yes vote. I don't know if that has ever been done before. Uh, it's something pretty phenomenal in this region, how we're coming together. So the referendum, or the plebiscite itself, uh, starts March 16th. Um, this is also something that's new to, I think, everyone, is the two and a half month voting period. So. Uh, Thank goodness municipal elections don't go that way. Uh, I could make a no hair joke that I'd be so stressed out, but that might not play too well. Um, but I think I would just, you know, I might grow hair, that's how stressful it would be. But um, that's, it's just, it, it, I don't know what it is, but it is what it is and we have to deal with it. So that's part of the plan. You know, we got a lot of energy ramping up to March 16th, but we also have to sustain that over the next two and a half months. So what does the plan do for us as we go through this region? When we started this plan, we invited all of the uh, local governments to our subcommittee table and said, tell us what you're doing, tell us how you're growing. We can read documents and we can read you know, updates on your OCPs, but tell us how this is working for you. Tell us what's going on in your community. And the thing that we heard from almost everyone is we are growing really fast right now. And so let me give you some examples, because we hear some of them, but let me give you some examples that were presented on how everybody's growing. Okay, so we all know Surrey's growing at about 1,200 people a month. Holy cow. Uh, Langley has to double in population in the next 25 years. Double. Uh, the northeast sector, Port Coquitlam, Coquitlam, Port Moody, is the fastest growing sub-region by percentage in Metro Vancouver right now. The city of Vancouver issued more residential building permits in 2013 than they have in the history of the city of Vancouver. North Shore is also gonna increase in population at a greater rate than they've ever seen in their past. So we got that and we went, oh my goodness, this is, this is real. This isn't just some planning exercise where a million more people are coming, they're coming right now. And with the lack of investment that we've seen over the last three years in transit and transportation, we know that congestion is getting worse around this region whether it's worse on a bus because it's passing you by because it's full, or worse on the road because it's taking you longer to get around. So we looked at how we need to look at this region as one area, not as silos within the region. So the first thing we did is we looked at the backbone of any transportation system and transit system is the buses. And so the plan calls for a 25% increase in buses. So now we'll see around the region, 70% of our region 70% of our residents will be within walking distance of a frequent transit network. So a frequent transit network is a bus that comes every 15 minutes. So basically, if you average it out, every seven and a half minutes you show up, a bus will be there. 70% of our residents, 84%, I think, of our businesses or our employee base will be within a frequent transit network. 
so you now don't have to memorize schedules. And I can tell you as a bus user, and especially a bus user that's not in the downtown peninsula where the bus comes every couple minutes, to Port Coquitlam where on nights and evenings it comes every hour, you really need to know the bus schedule because if you miss it, you're screwed, especially if you're in the evening. Right? If, frankly, it's faster for me to walk across my whole town than it is for me to wait for the next bus. It just is, right? So if the bus comes every seven and a half minutes, I'm okay, I don't need to memorize it, I just show up and it's there, 70% of the residents. But we also see a 50% increase in CBUS service. So the CBUS, which is jammed every morning, will come every 10 minutes during peak period and 15 minutes in off-peak time. We'll see, uh, one of, the, I think, the most transformational parts of this plan that isn't talked about a lot is the 11 new B-line or rapid bus lines around the region. 11, we have three right now. So we'll have 11. You know, for my community in the Northeast sector, there'll be two new B-lines that go in from uh, the Evergreen Line to Ma Maple Ridge and to Langley. There'll be another one that goes in the other direction to Surrey. There's three on the North Shore. There's th a few in Vancouver here. Uh, there's a few that are going out to Surrey. It's incredible because that's a bus then that comes every five minutes during peak period and about every seven minutes in off-peak period. It's fast and it's rapid. And in fact, what we said in the plan is it's gonna be beeline or better. So the better part is if we can develop a business case and make a bus rapid transit system out of it. So you're basically getting the, uh, almost the capacity of an LRT, but on a bus route. And we see those all around the world. I'm excited in my area because I think that's a really viable to connect Coquitlam Center, the Evergreen Line Station to Maple Ridge along the Low Heat Highway. Um, so that's a, a huge investment. S moving forward around healthier communities, we also uh, want, we put in new capital money into the biking system. So 2,700 kilometers of bikeways around the system. Better connections for walking, not only between communities, but into the transit system. And then a $22 million, in, and so that equals a $22 million investment each and every year into walking and cycling systems throughout this region. So we hear a lot about the connecting communities through rapid transit, no doubt, uh, a very expensive, but a very important aspect of building it. And there's two aspects here. The extension of the Millennium Line down Broadway to Arbutus is about servicing an area. 48% of the people that use the Broadway corridor right now are not from Vancouver. It is a regional transit line. 4% of the people are actually from Port Coquitlam. Right? So when people say to me, why are we building that big thing in Vancouver? It won't help me in Poco. Actually, it will. And that will increase when some university student in Port Coquitlam can get on at the Evergreen Line at Coquitlam Center and take one SkyTrain all the way to Arbutus and jump on a B-Line bus to get to UBC. That's pretty phenomenal service where you can go that distance. Then the light rail in Surrey, connecting Surrey. There's two lines in Surrey, an L-Line connecting uh, King George and uh, 104th, and then uh, down and out the Fraser Highway to um, Langley, the second line. And that's about shaping a community. It's about shaping a community that's growing. But if we can shape a community around our transit system, we can ensure that density occurs where it should occur, which will help the, um, the, the, the desire from developers to push out into the green space, because it'll encourage more development around density. And you'll start to shape a community in a phenomenal way. But we also know that our current rail system is over capacity. So this will also add 220 new trains or new cars to the existing SkyTrain Millennium or Ever Expo Millennium and Candeline. Um, and if any of you, and I'm sure most of the people in this room do take transit quite frequently, and if you're taking the, any of those lines in the morning, you know that not only are you standing room only, sometimes you're actually getting passed up on the Expo line now because it's full. 10 new cars and one new locomotive for the West Coast Express, which I can tell you from being from that part of the, the lower mainland, it is standing room only by the time you, the train gets to Coquitlam Center. Uh, and when you get on in Port Coquitlam, you're about 50% of the people get a seat, 50% are standing, I'd have to say anecdotally. Uh, but by Port Moody, it's rare to find a seat. Um, so that'll add extra capacity as well as station upgrades around the region. So a lot of this is about protecting, not only servicing the million more people coming, but how do we maintain and protect our environment that we have here and improve our public health? So right now our motor vehicles in Metro Vancouver currently emit about 4.4 million tons of greenhouse gas. And of course, if you had a million more people in this region, uh, you could do some math there to figure out how much that would grow if there's a no vote and people are gonna end up driving more. 
But through this plan, adding a million more people over the next 30 years, we actually keep the, the greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles at the same rate it is today. Right? So yes, we would love to push it down, and that's all of our goals. But when you have that much, much more capacity coming into a system, I think it's a pretty good achievement if we at least keep it flat to start with. The plan also improves public health. Uh, because there is a, a case to be made between public health and transportation. One of the things is that uh, if you take transit, you walk on average 40 more minutes a week than someone that drives. Uh, I could tell you I take transit, and I think I walk 40 more minutes than if I was driving just today. <laughs> and especially if I miss my bus on the way home, it'll be an extra 40 minutes to walk home. Uh, not from here, but from Coquitlam Centre. <laughs> um, and we've also, and we've seen most notably uh, Dr. Patricia Daly, who's come out, the Chief Medical Health Officer for the Vancouver Coastal Health, who refers to this plan as the next great public health legacy. So we know that there's healthcare um, uh, benefits to creating a transit plan and, and, and helping out with that. As I talked about, the plan also helps us protect the environment by avoiding sprawl that can occur. We know that, um, that there is just pressure for sprawl to occur, but we also know the flip side of it is when you build a transportation system and you build rapid transit lines, whether it's a bus rapid transit or rail rapid transit or a good transit network, people do want to live close to it. And so when we can tie together our Metro 2040 with this transit plan, we will help encourage the type of density and the type of uh, planning that we need to see around this region. So what does a no vote mean? So a no vote does not mean status quo. Status quo would basically mean we're getting enough revenue in each year to keep up with the cost of delivering the existing service. We know over the last three years uh, that that hasn't occurred when there has been no new revenue. So when you look at it, it costs on average about 6.9% a year to keep up with the current system. And, and let's face it, the current system isn't great. There's, there's pass-ups all over the place. There's overcrowding on the, the bus lines. There's optimization, which means taking lower bus ridership in suburban areas and putting it into higher ridership areas which is great to service that area, but it doesn't help shape communities. So looking at that, TransLink has the ability to increase property taxes by 3% a year without asking, right? And usually about 1% of that is actual property tax increase on your tax bill, and the rest is just through growth in the region. So 3% increase in that revenue, but it's growing at about 7%. So in theory, you have about a 4% decrease in your transit service every year with a no vote. So what does that look like? We actually, you know, we talk about peak oil. Well, we, we passed peak bus service a few years ago. Um, and it's going to steadily decline if there's no new revenue going into it. I don't mean to be doom and gloom. These are just the facts, Jack. This is what's going to happen. And so we see that in 2013, there was 2.5 hours per capita of service. And by 2023, that'll drop down to 2.33. And that'll continue to slide. And, uh, and that's just not something I think that is acceptable to anyone in this region. Further, we wouldn't meet our regional goals of um, diverting um, or, or uh, shaping how we use our transportation and traffic system. When we actually developed the goal, when we developed the strategy, we had two primary goals. And these were two of TransLink's long-term goals. The first one was to have a 50-50 mode share. So 50% of the traffic in the region is taken by bus or transit, biking or walking, and 50% by vehicle. That was our goal. You know, as you can see up here, uh, right now it's 14%. So that's our goal in the region. Um, and our second goal was that we reduce the amount, that uh, re reduce the distance people have to travel by one third, right? So if we can reduce the amount of car traffic and we can reduce the distance people are driving, that was our goal. And every bus route, every project that we put in here, we measured it to those goals. And our congestion, you know, frankly, will just get worse and worse and worse. And as we show in these pictures, it's not just congestion on the roads, that's the obvious one. It's the congestions on the bus and the transit system. Uh, and it's already congested. Uh, we need to look at being stuck in traffic more. We came out with a study that said that uh, right now congestion costs the economy about a billion dollars right now. And in uh, 25 years, if we vote no and nothing gets implemented, it'll cost the economy $2 billion a year. You know, those are real factors that we have to take into consideration as we move forward. And finally, there's no plan B. 
Um, there is no, you know, and people say, well, why wouldn't you develop a plan B? That seems, you know, so, you know, short-sighted. And I said, well, first of all, there's no plan B because the, the province said that any new funding has to go to referendum. So I guess the plan B would be another referendum. But they also said that you can't go to another referendum until the next municipal election three and a half years from now. So we got lots of time to figure out that plan B. But there is no plan B. There is the plan B, as we stated earlier, is not status quo. It's actually a reduction in the current service levels that we have. And that's an important thing for people to realize. There is no silver bullet. The mayors have been very clear that property tax is not the way to fund more transit service in the region. Uh, and in fact, if we had to increase property tax, it would be much more on a per household basis than the, uh, the sales tax. And so this is by far the, the fairest way to go. So I encourage you, uh, hopefully this is a pretty friendly crowd, to vote yes. <laughs> Nothing got thrown, so that was good. Um, that hasn't happened yet, by the way. Um, register to vote, pledge to vote, spread the word. This is, this is no doubt a tough campaign. This is not like a municipal campaign. This is something that happens a while. And this is something where, frankly, we need all hands on deck, whether you're phoning your friends, using your social media, talking to your network, talking to your colleagues at work, and have a good conversation about the, with them about why this is so important, not only to you, but to your, your community, uh, your work, and to the future of this region. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mayor, for your leadership on this important issue facing our region and this important decision. To hear more about the implications of this decision, I'm going to invite our panel to make its way up to the stage. And I'm also going to introduce our moderator tonight, uh, Thai journalist Jeff Dembecki. Uh, Jeff Dembecki uh, is a leading sustainability writer for the Thai. He's reported from such places as Beijing, Hawaii, San Francisco, New York, and Washington, DC. In addition to uh, the Thai writing, um, He's appeared in Foreign Policy, Vice, Salon, Walrus, and the Toronto Star. So we've got a great pleasure to have Jeff Dembecki uh, lead our moderating of the panel. So um, Jeff, please come up and uh, introduce the panel. Thank you so much. So hello everyone, and I guess I would invite the other panelists to come up onto the stage and I can start introducing all of them. And so while everyone makes their way up, um, I'd just like to point out that we have um, a pretty good cross section of people up here who are in favor of the, the transit referendum. And if, if I really had to go out on a limb, I would um, probably say that most people in this room support transit as well. I know that I came in on my bike and the bike rack was absolutely jammed. I could not find a spot on it. So I feel pretty confident about that. And I think that this conversation um, in that case will be most interesting if, if we look at some of the challenges that the yes side faces and, and how we might overcome them. So to, um, to help us, um, um, in that discussion, we have at the very end, obviously, Greg Moore, who just spoke. And then beside him, we have Richard Johnston. So he's a, a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of British Columbia, and he holds the Canada Research Chair in Public Opinion, Elections, and Representation. And then beside him, we have Bahare Jokar and she's the Associate Vice President of External Affairs of the Alma Mater Society at UBC um, since September 2013. And she also recently became one of the four co-chairs of the Better Transit and Transportation Coalition where she represents the student voice. And then finally, we have Jeff Meggs, who was elected to City Council in November 2008 on the Vision Vancouver team. And in 2011, he was appointed as a Vancouver director of the Metro Vancouver Board, um, where he serves on the housing and transportation committees. And Jeff's also had um, a huge number of um, roles in, in BC and across the Lower Mainland as an executive assistant to Mayor Larry Campbell, communications director for the Hospital Employees Union, 
and um, executive director of the BC Federation of Labor. So I'm just gonna jump in and I'm gonna start with a question that I'm gonna put out to each of you separately and then after that I have more targeted questions that we can use to um, create a discussion. And if I manage to burn through all my questions really fast, then we can ask you what you think. So um, I guess to start out then generally, so Stephen Quinn recently lamented in the Globe and Mail that the, the yes side, though he supports it, it hasn't, it hasn't captured his imagination. The campaign has been all head and no heart so far. So. Um, speaking to climate change and, and sustainability, I'm wondering if each of you could sort of describe what the, the broader vision of this plan is, why it's important, and what type of future um, someone is building by, by voting yes in the referendum. So we'll start with you, Jeff. Well, thanks, Jeff. I thought Stephen Quinn's piece was quite compelling because it's always a challenge in politics to communicate that human dimension, and I think that's what he was speaking to. Uh, from a climate change perspective, uh, Greg laid it out really well. I mean, we just can't pave more of the lower mainland. There's no room for it, even if we thought that was a desirable course of action. You can't manage future growth without, uh, without a massive investment in sustainable transportation. And you can't assume either that we're gonna be able to make a transition away from automobiles, trucks, and other things very, very quickly or instantaneously. So what I think the plan does very effectively is give people transportation choices and provide that capacity for them to move into uh, whatever uh, mode they think is right for a given project that they're undertaking. And this is one of the areas that I think is very, very important to understand. This is a, a plan that tries to look holistically at our challenges, both in terms of moving goods and moving people. It understands that some days people are gonna to have to use the car to get their kids to childcare, for example, but the next day might be able to walk to school or the day after that take a train and provide those transportation choices for everybody. We're looking to manage growth, uh, not by driving down car use, but by continuing uh, the, its role at its current level. So growth would be in these sustainable options. And I think that's an important message. I just wanna add one last thing, which I think is important on the human side. To, whether you drive or whether you uh, take the bus, this plan would probably take 20 minutes a day out of your commute at least, probably 20 minutes each way. And to me, that's a very powerful statement of, of freedom and choice, that you get that 20 to 40 minutes a day to do whatever you want, to work longer or spend more time with your kids. But to me, that's what a, a progressive society is all about. And it's, it's completely woven into the whole way I think we should plan our region, the way we should plan our planet. And uh, that's why I think it's good fundamentally is a supported plan. And the, the message, at least the material core of the message, I think is exactly as Greg laid it out. Uh, you have to basically tell people what's going to happen to the transportation system. That's one part of it. And the other part of it is that you have to attack the status quo. The status quo is not as it is now. It is, it is an evolving world, uh, which in, on every indicator would be worse by criteria that pretty much everybody agrees on are bad. And actually, in the, in the interest of time, I, I guess we, we've heard um, your vision, Greg. <laughs> as, as, as great as, as that was, but I, I, um, I'd, I'd like to ask you specifically about the no side, because that's what you're up against. Um, and so you, you mentioned that there's a very diverse coalition in favor of the transit referendum. Um, I think you said 110 groups or something. Um, and I, I think that's fantastic. Um, but when I look at the no side, I see that they have several strategic advantages. And um, obviously the first is that they're arguing against a new tax. Um, but I think it also comes down to a question of narrative because the, the no side has a really clearly defined enemy, which is TransLink. And Jordan Bateman has built a, a David, and Gol David versus Goliath campaign where he's the ever man, every man taking on vested interests, which as we know is it's, it's a powerful narrative and, and a powerful message. So I guess, um, Greg, strategically, um, how, how do you counter that when, when you're looking to sway people? <laughs> well, if anybody knows that silver bullet. Um, <laughs> So we're doing two things on the, on the campaign side of things. One, and the most part, we're talking about 
the problem, which is a million more people coming, and that we're now in the process to the previous question, actually, of breaking down the plan in our education campaign into neighborhood levels or city levels. So that you know, if you live in Maple Ridge, you'll understand what's in the plan for you and you can see, you see the problem because you're in the traffic every day and now you'll see the solution by the two new Beeline buses, the new buses, and I won't name the neighborhoods, but in the neighborhoods and that sort of thing. So you can start to see how to get out of it. The other part is um, you will start to see us um, counter some of the myths that the no side has created around TransLink because they're just, they're frankly taking uh, you know, the first two words of a sentence but not completing the sentence. And so we're gonna complete that uh, hopefully coming up this week um, to bring it out there. There's, there's some really great things to talk about uh, with TransLink. You know, the 99.8% on-time service, the 74% um, uh, satisfaction rating from users, the 54% fare box recovery, which is the second highest in North America. Right, there is a lot of, you know, one thing to people talk about the finances of TransLink and you know, this, this where's the money going? Um, well, TransLink actually has to go out to the market to get their own debt. So that means they have to have a house, a financial house that is really well managed and well financed into the future or else they won't be able to go borrow money. Well, they have AA credit ratings with the credit rating agencies. So that's the third party groups that look at the financial stability, everything from federal governments to private sector and they've rated them quite high. So, you know, we're gonna come out with some of those messages. You know, the other one that drives me nuts is the, you know, how much we pay the CEO, right? They get paid well, no doubt about it. And they compare it to the Seattle CEO that makes 150,000 less. Do you know there's nine uh, transit CEOs in Seattle? And there's four in, or there's eight in Toronto, there's like 18 in Los Angeles. So yeah, you can pluck one out and say he makes more than that one person. But when you put the CEOs together, uh, we have one. And we're actually, TransLink is the model for every other transit authority around North America that they could have one transit authority. Not one bus authority, one train authority, one boat authority, one road authority, and one something else, West Coast Express authority. We've got one. That's what everybody wants. And everywhere else has you know, five, ten times as many. So we're going to come up with some of those messages to try to counter it. By no means do we think that we can change the image of TransLink within a week or two or a month or two, that's gonna be a long-term strategy that TransLink needs to endeavor. Uh, but we need to, we will be coming out with some of the counter to that no side messaging. Well, I think it, partly in response to Richard's comments too, what is, was, is, has to be kept in mind. And one thing that I think people who support the plan lose sight of is that, is that this is an extraordinarily difficult campaign to organize unless you're the no side, in which case you answer the phone and bash TransLink. <laughs> and, you know, there's lots to be said about TransLink if you want to, but that's not what we, you wouldn't say the crime rate's too high, let's cut the police, or I couldn't get seen fast enough at the emergency room, let's cut hours at the emergency room. But somehow <laughs> or other, it's not laughable to uh, say, we're seeing a downward turn in service, we should cut funding. Uh, and I think that those who are out there, it's, it should just be saying, you know, we need to talk about the content of the plan, because uh, it's just a fact that this campaign's being organized very quickly with rules that only became partly transparent a couple of weeks ago across 35 provincial ridings by groups of people who've never worked together before. And I don't know anyone yet who's come up to me and said, I hate the plan. Mm -hmm. What they have is a concern about this or that issue with TransLink or this or that issue with something else. And even the no side will not oppose the plan. They just pretend it can be financed out of thin air. So, you know, I think that we should make sure we keep our eye on the ball. And as Richard says, the ball is the plan. That's what the vote's about. And we need to make sure that we stay on that front. It's exceedingly difficult to do what uh, the Mayor's Council and the Coalition are trying to do, and they're doing the best they can. Great, and so I'm just gonna return to you, um, Jeff, because I have a, a second question about the, the no side. Um, and so as, as we all know, it's, it's rare for um, all of Metro Vancouver to, to vote on a, a single um, issue and referendum like this, and as we know, we have a huge range of demographics and, and lifestyles um, across the Lower Mainland. Um, and I, I saw a recent poll saying that the, the no votes were growing, and part of this was due to, um, to drivers and, and people in um, more suburban communities um, saying that they were um, opposed to the transit referendum. And, and so I guess my question is, with the no side basically running um, a cut the gravy train campaign against TransLink, 
Is there um, any concern that we could face a situation like we saw in Toronto with Rob Ford where um, suburban voters are using this referendum as kind of a, a protest against um, an urban constituency? Yeah, but I would say that suburban voters are right to be angry because as a result of the incessant squeezing of funding and the failure over a number of cycles to get appropriate funding for TransLink, services declined in the suburbs. You know, the, the service optimization that TransLink was forced to undertake, undertake to cut so-called waste, you know, in some people's minds, a bus that has 10 seats on it is wasting space. Mm -hmm. I think it's there for new riders who need to come on. It's providing that choice. And uh, you saw the curve going down here. That curve will accelerate and head straight down if we don't get additional funding. Uh, why won't the mayors use property tax? And Greg started to touch on that because they know they're going to have to raise property tax to pay for sewage, waste management, f police, fire, and a host of other things the voters will simply not accept having reduced. And, and I think those things need to get out there and we need to be more clear about that. That's where I think we need to challenge uh, the no side more directly to be to become clean with people and say their plan is really just to simply reduce the uh, transportation and transit options for the region. And then I, I have a question for you, Bahara. Um, so we we hear it all the time um, that young people are more progressive. Young people are the future. Um, young people support action on climate change but they're just apathetic and they don't vote, so it doesn't really matter. And, and so I'm wondering, as, as someone who's really trying to get students engaged on this issue, I mean, what can you do to, to actually make young people vote in what sounds like a very complicated process? While the process for this specific referendum is a little complicated because it is a mail-in ballot, mm -hmm. the plan isn't. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're talking about 400 new buses, you know, when you're talking about substantial increase to service, when you're talking about night bus service, which I can guarantee you means a lot to students because a lot of us are busing home very late at night, whether it's coming off of a late night class or getting home after a social event, whatever it may be, we can't afford to cab, so we're depending on public transit. Um, the, the message is really clear, you know, and, and for a student who's being passed up during peak hours on a regular basis, heading to and from campus, I don't think it's going to be hard to convince them to vote. Um, it's more a matter of just providing them with a simple means of getting registered, receiving the ballot, and making it easy for them to submit the ballot. Um, when it comes to this referendum, when it comes to a question of general voter apathy, that's, that's a whole other conversation. I don't think we have that much time tonight. <laughs> I, I did hear you were offering coffee and beer. <laughs> um, is, is that true? Uh, the coffee is free, the beer is not, because that's not okay. Um, no, uh, yeah, no, Coffee for Commuters, uh, it's a program that we started actually a week and a half ago. It's been really, really productive. We've, con we've reached out to uh, close to 900 students so far, which I'm very excited about. And what it is, is basically just um, providing a warm cup of coffee on a cold morning when you're coming into campus. And we provide you with a little, um, a postcard similar to what I have here for the Better Trans and Transportation Coalition um, that outlines the benefits of the plan, how you can register to vote, and where you can learn more. And um, really, it's about informing students, telling them what options are available to them, and just really encouraging them to get involved. Because I, I don't think it's a question of apathy. I think it's a question of just lack of information, right? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're provided with the information, you will participate when you know what the stakes are. Mm -hmm. Right, and then um, Richard, I have a, a question for you. So um, the, the head of Surrey's Board of Trade recently said that um, this transit question never should have gone to a, a referendum because the issue is just too complex to talk about in this short of time um, when you're dealing with um, a whole bunch of um, political arguments alongside it. And, and so I'm, I'm curious, um, when we're talking about big new investments in our future as a, a city and a society, as, especially as they relate to climate change, what are your thoughts on the the referendum process, is it good to go this way or does it actually make it harder to achieve progress? Whether it's too complex, I mean, this, it is a fearsomely complex question. Just look at Greg's presentation. I mean, it still has to be distilled into this number of buses and this number of trains and stuff like that. So, it's, so that, so that even, even the distillation is complex. There's no getting around that. So what do, so what are, what do voters do in the face of this complexity? Well, one thing is, who's, who are the agenda setters here? Who's the supporting coalition? It is a good thing 
that's a very broad supporting coalition, and the breadth of that coalition needs to be underscored and needs to be delivered, practically speaking, on the doorstep. But it, is, it isn't like Rob Ford in Mississauga. It is, it's, not, it's not a unified region that way, and the mayors of the suburbs are on side with this. Okay, so that's, so that's good news. I think that the, the breadth of civil society support, including the Fed, is, is important to this, and I think that one of the things that has to happen is that this city, which is particularly deep in civil society, it's really pretty much the deepest in Canada, that civil society has to get out there and mobilize. So, it, so at least it can be turned into a kind of a mobilization phenomenon where the general credibility of municipal politicians, I mean, the, there, there is still more esteem for and trust in municipal politicians than in provincial or federal ones. You guys need to cash that out to the, to the extent that you can. So to a certain extent, it, it is a kind of trust us mm -hmm. argument here. It's a good comment about the suburban mayors. I should have said that. That's yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it's no accident that mayor, you know, Surrey and Vancouver are the kind of the co-chairs. And that's, that's where the numbers are. And I just wanted to ask a quick follow-up because I know that you've, you've studied a lot of these different types of referendums and we just heard about um, Proposition 23 today. I'm wondering if you could draw any comparisons and, and maybe talk about some of the, the most valuable lessons that you think the yes side could take away. Well, part of the problem is that, it, is that th there were fundamentally different exercises, right? This, this, that was not a referendum, that was an initiative. So the, so the initiative lies with the private citizens. Now in California, it's ridiculously easy to qualify an initiative and you can basically qualify with the money campaign. But in general, other things equal, no's will trump yeses, right? So Wade and his people had a, had a built-in structural advantage there. Money. Money can, money can defeat referendums, but it's actually quite hard just to spend money to win the yes. And so uh, the fact that there was a lot of money behind the yes side in California wasn't as great an advantage as it would have been had they been trying to defeat something. So that's another, <laughs> that's another way in which. And then there's the fact that it's a mail ballot. I mean, we, don't, we, we, we have very little knowledge at this point about how our mail ballot plays out. What we know in the limited amount of comparison that's available to us is that in, in Oregon, where all ballots are mail ballots, whether they're initiatives, referendums, or, or just plain votes, turnout didn't go down, it was about the same. We know that in the, GS, in the uh, HST referendum that it was about a 51 or 52% uh, registered of the registered vote. It was 53 in the provincial election. So people, you know, the, the, the convenient side of the mail ballot seems to be offsetting whatever is lost through not having a focused campaign. And I hope you guys are thinking about, all of you, what, what does that mean? Are you, are you gonna be able to track receipts of mail ballots? Uh, what sort of follow-up strategies will you have? Uh, I'm actually, although I'm not sanguine about this, I'm not actually all that pessimistic either, given that you do have two and a half to three months, and there is a sense in which you have, you have more, con you may have more concrete information than in most campaigns about how it's going, <laughs> and how you might engage in course correction as required. <laughs>Yeah, we, uh, the plan actually lays out um, when each of the projects would come in. So obviously everything in Port Coquitlam will happen first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll go from there. Um, but it, but, it, but it, I'll just give you a, a thumbnail sketch of how it works. Um, uh, your road projects, your cycling, walking, uh, your night bus service, uh, can happen almost immediately because you don't have to buy any capital. You know, you don't have to go buy a bus or something. You, you know, night bus services taking your high-level buses that you have during the day that don't run at night and just training drivers. So those happen almost immediately. Uh, uh, you then start to immediately procure the buses uh, for the system, but it takes about a year and a half or so to procure the bus, train the, train, train the driver and that sort of thing. Uh, so those are the things that happen relatively quickly. Uh, then the things that happen in the background within the first couple of years is the detailed design work for the uh, Millennium Extension along Broadway, as well as the L Line in Surrey. And so those are going to take a few years to do the detailed design, and you probably get a shovel in the ground, I don't know, in year four or five-ish, somewhere in there. Um, the second line in Surrey, the one that goes to Langley, 
will start uh, a shovel in the ground when the L line is complete. So that won't actually start until probably year seven or eight after the uh, L line in Surrey's uh, opened up. And then you do have a phasing in, oh, and your West Coast Express, the first phase of the West Coast Express, trains will get procured right away. And then you have a phasing in of the second round of bus service that comes in year five and six. Um, so there is kind of two waves of the bus service implementation. So uh, there's two campaigns that are going on, right? There's the Mayor's Council campaign, which is about the advertising um, telephone. There's, I think, 20 some odd telephone town hall meetings going on. There was two rallies today, one at the C bus with Mayor Misato, welcoming people off the C bus. Maria Harris was at UBC this afternoon. I'll be at West Coast Express in Poco tomorrow morning. So every day there's two or three of those going on around the region. Um, as well as we have teams of people going into the universities and other transit hubs to ID the vote and all that sort of stuff. Um, if you're on most progressive lifts, you'll probably get a few phone calls in the next couple of weeks, I would suggest, unless our list management is really good and you'll only get one. Um, <laughs> but there's no guarantee there. So that's what we're doing from the Mayor's Council uh, campaign. It's some of the stuff that maybe we need to get out there more and let people know that these jazzy things are happening. Uh, but they are happening around the region. <coughs> and I guess on behalf of the Better Transit and Transportation Coalition, there's both a ground game and, and an online game. So for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, bettertransit.info is the website you go to pledge your vote. We want to get that number raised, um, essentially, and, and what that does is it assists us in voter identification. But in addition to that, yes, we have 110 organizations, but the diversity of these organizations in and of themselves have a massive outreach across Metro Vancouver. And our hope is not only to mobilize our membership, but get our membership to mobilize their internal community. So I, just speaking on behalf of the students, like we have, I wanna say, six student associations that have come on to the Better Transit and Transportation Coalition, and, and hopefully we'll have a couple more coming on this coming week, uh, but collectively we all support. And so what's happening is that, that, that our outreach is going to be about 145,000 students across Metro Vancouver. Like, and, and then there's a lot of grassroots organizations that have very, very wide outreach, and it's all about that community engagement component. So getting the organizations themselves to talk to their members and to raise the profile and to raise the issue. And, and then again, and the second fold is to, to get registered and, and to pledge your vote. Right, pledge your vote, tell your friends to pledge their vote, and then that way we're gonna see the numbers rising and the profile rising, essentially. So that's what you want people to do, like this whole room, like what do you want us to do? Bettertransit.info, pledge your vote. Yeah, no, I've been there, we yeah. just want us to pledge our vote. Yeah. Pledge your vote and tell your friends, have, have these conversations. Have your neighbors come over. Yeah. Have your neighbors come over. Neighbors for dessert and coffee. Exactly. The, the hidden and secret, the hidden secret in electoral turnout is people being asked to vote. Yeah. And a large part of the story of the decline of turnout of the last 30 years is the evaporation of the doorstep campaign. And so to the extent that you have choices at the margin between putting money or effort into phone banks or money or effort into getting to the doorstep, go to the doorstep. In fact, even if it's fewer doorsteps, there's a bigger return from that than from any telephone campaign. And I can tell you that we do have a big doorstep campaign. It's both at knocking on doors and it's also going to where groups of people congregate together. Um, so it is in the strategy. The, the investments that are there are going through an audited third party process to be sure they're spent on improving service. And, the, uh, and, and that is the focus of this, of this whole exercise. Yeah. First of all, I'll just say on the Compass Card, uh, it is being rolled out this year. So it's being rolled out to students right now. It'll be rolled out to West Coast Express users uh, later on the spring, early summer. Uh, and it's on a schedule now to be rolled out fully throughout the system. Um, yeah, there was delays in it. Yeah, it's $20 million over budget. But you know what? TransLink delivered over $10 billion of projects over the last 12 years. And to take this one and all of a sudden say they can't manage capital project, I think is a little disingenuous into the larger discussion. It's like saying that everybody's riding the system for free because there was, uh, whatever it was, 2.4 million people got uh, the, the button, the unfair, unpaid button uh, was pushed by uh, transit riders or transit bus drivers. But there was 355 million people that boarded the system and did pay. 
There's half a billion dollars in revenue coming from transit riders every year compared to the 2.4 million that people got on. And I take the bus, and I can tell you, I'm glad the bus driver let some of those people on for free and they didn't leave them behind, that mom that couldn't afford it. So the second part around the tax itself, um, there is no transit system that I'm aware of in the world that is profitable. So part of the funding that's going to go into it is going to pay for operating costs of the system. We're not just building capital, we're, we're funding operational costs. I talked that TransLink is 54% fare box recovery. Well, there's 46% that needs to be subsidized on those 400 new buses. Uh, there's other parts of the system that will need to be subsidized. Uh, the capital projects themselves uh, usually is about a 20 or 30 year payback period on that debt, so that mortgage. Whoever's mayor or governing TransLink in 30 years when they pay off the, the debt on those capital items, they can make a choice whether they want to reduce this or if they see it for other investments at that time. So we're going to have to end right here. And I'll just say that as a journalist, I'm supposed to remain really objective on all sorts of things like this. But like I said, I rode my bike here. And if I happen to get a flat tire, I'm going to have to jump on a bus. So I'm going to wish all of you the best of luck. <laughs> <laughs>
thanks to our volunteers, to Ellen, Gail, uh, Gervier, and also to young Gabo and Luca here, um, who, who may have greeted you at the door. Um, this is uh, the end of our formal program, um, but the networking and the dialogue can continue. Uh, please join us in the reception. Free coffee, but it is a cash bar, and uh, hope to see you uh, uh, later this evening. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>